What's going on, pool chasers, and welcome to episode 100. 100 episodes. Can you believe it? <laughs> I can't, man. It's been a pretty crazy, awesome journey, and I'm super excited for this episode. Yeah, we've got an incredible episode for you all, we think anyway. After interviewing so many incredible people and listening to their journey to be the people they are and run the companies that they run, we decided to turn this around a bit and share with you all our story from the very beginning. This wasn't an easy story to tell. We've gotten to know a lot of you on a personal level, and we thought that this would just be a, a really good time to share our entire story with you all. Yeah. The backstories are one of our favorite parts of each episode. It tells the journey of where somebody came from to who they are today. And we get asked quite a bit, you know, about our backstory because we don't look the same. We call each other brothers. So we have to tell that story a lot, but it's hard to tell in 20 minutes. So this journey is, like you said, it's it's not an easy one to tell, but it means a lot to both you and I personally. I think if you know us, you'll understand us quite a bit more after this episode. It's very special and I hope it really kind of inspires people in a way. Yeah. So thank you all so much for listening to this episode. We are forever grateful, especially those of you that have been listening since the very beginning. We really appreciate you. We appreciate your ears and welcome to episode 100. We hope you enjoy. Welcome to your go-to podcast for the pool and spa industry. My name is Tyler Rasmussen. And my name is Greg Diafania. And this is the Pool Chasers Podcast. So I was born in West Covina, California. I moved to Victorville when I was about three years old. My parents actually built the house that we lived in all of my life. So we moved up there. And then I lived there, you know, all the way until I moved to Arizona 22 years or so I lived in that same house. You know, the house had many transitions over the years. When I remember first living there, the backyard was full of dirt. There's nothing back there, which is much different than when you were <laughs> living with us. But there was a completely dirt backyard. To the left side where the pool is now, there was like a doughboy pool. And then there was this like little patio with like a tiny patch of grass and this white picket fence around the grass. I didn't know that. You guys had a doughboy? Yeah. <laughs> it's a little like circle one. And it was all in complete dirt. It got the whole thing dirty. I seriously cannot imagine <laughs> that backyard, just dirt and a doughboy. But I continue. know. It's crazy. <laughs> but then there was like the second half where the garage is now, there was just dirt. And we had these little ATVs when I was younger, which I think when you grow up in high desert, that's pretty much expected of you to have these little oh, ATVs. Definitely. <laughs> Which is funny because I never really got into that, but you know, I was into it when I was younger. So we had this little quad and I remember I wasn't allowed to ride it much often by myself without them watching me, but I was out there for some reason all alone pretty much. And I ran straight like both wheels into the front of the fence. Didn't, I didn't know how to let go of the handlebars back then. So like I completely flipped over my body. My arms were like behind me stuck to the handlebars and it was probably like, <laughs> It was like one of the most painful things I can remember as a kid. And nobody was like back there with me. I had to like go and tell my parents. I don't, I don't know if I was like not supposed to be on there or what really the story was, but I do remember flipping over that. You're kind of accident prone. So <laughs> I, that is definitely true. <laughs> I can totally see this happening. And then Tyler was done with ATVs forever. Probably forever. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, when I was about 11 years old, we kind of transitioned the backyard again. So they built the in-ground pool. Doughboy was gone, patio was built, grass was there. So they built the pool first and then the patch towards where the end where the garage was built when I was like 15 years old. So they built this mother-in-law quarters, which you and I ended up living in together for a few years with this massive garage. My dad always enjoyed working on cars. So it was pretty much completely filled with everything you need to do to work on cars. But I don't really remember him working on cars very much. <laughs> I know we built a gym in it for a while with a, there was a boxing bag and a bunch of, you know, gym equipment because we played football together, but I don't remember too many cars in there. Hitting the punching bag is about all I remember Yeah, <laughs> doing in there. <laughs> so I remember cleaning it a couple of times. That's for Yes. Sure. <laughs> How could I forget? Yeah, I cleaned that thing quite a few times. 
So it was pretty cool because I got to move in kind of into mother-in-law quarters. My parents built it pretty much for my grandparents, but they lived a lot longer, I think, than any of us expected. So nobody really lived in that house except for us kids. So I moved in there when I was 15, kind of really cool to be on your own by yourself out in this pretty much like your own apartment. You know, there's a fridge and kitchen and bathroom, everything in there that you would need. So it was a little studio apartment. You know, I was raised in a pretty amazing home and an amazing home environment. And our stories can't be more opposite, I think, in a lot of that degree. So we'll get into kind of that piece of it for me. My parents, you know, are still married to this day. They very loving, very caring home. So I was very blessed to be around people who cared about me my whole life and loved on me my whole life. My mom stayed home, you know, with us pretty much since I was like three or four, you know, all the way up till she were, did real estate or something when I was, after I left college. But up until that point, most of our life, she stayed at home with us. And, you know, I always remember these like real talks with my mom late at night when I would come home from working at Pizza Hut or working somewhere at Diamond Mattress with you. But I would come home and she always, she always stays up really late. So it'd be just her and me kind of had these really deep talks. It was really important for my life for, on a lot of reasons with girls, with just life in general. You know, those were some of my favorite times with my mom ever. And, you know, those were really special to me still to this day. And my dad, you know, worked very hard to give us kind of a good life. And, but somehow, you know, always made every major event in our lives, made every ball game in our lives, except for one. And that was <laughs> the only home run I've ever hit in my whole life. He was like showed up late in the like seventh inning of the game, and I hit the home run in the beginning of the game. So that sucked. I remember that man. That was <laughs> such an awesome hit, and it's even crazier too because your dad wanted you to play baseball. I know so bad from <laughs> even before I came into the picture, but he wanted you to play baseball, and you pretty much focused on basketball and and football. Yeah, and you hit a dinger out of the park and. <laughs> Pops didn't make it. Yeah. That sucks. That sucks really bad because he pretty much made every game. So I just give him. Anybody ever catch that on that. film? I don't think so. No. We lost that game like 18 to 3. I mean, we got whooped. And somehow just got a hanging curveball that I took out sounds to left about, field. Sounds but. about right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of our games were like that. <laughs> but that meant a lot to me, you know, that he would come and make all these games and everything. It was pretty impressive. And the more. I get older and I spend time with my kids and I see how difficult that balance is, the more I appreciate that. And I don't think you ever really appreciate it as a kid as much. I mean, I always felt really special that he was there, but when you're a kid, you don't really notice some of that stuff. So the more I, I age and the more I'm becoming a dad and spending time doing that, I feel that balance and I'm pretty impressed with the amount of time he actually spent at home and with the life that we were able to have because we did have a pretty great, you know, life. He made good money and, and treated us well. So, you know, he worked very, very hard, but then was always there. So it meant a lot to me. You know, we went some really amazing family vacations are probably my biggest memories. You know, I've been to Hawaii, I think three times with them, once with you, which we'll talk about later. Went to Disney World, Disneyland, any theme park you could think of. I went on two cruises when I was younger cruises were always fun and I wouldn't go on one right now, but, um, I have a lot of memories on the cruises. So those are a lot of my favorite memories. Road trips too. Yeah. Up. Yeah. Road trips. <laughs> I, I'm going to get to that one. <laughs> so my least favorite vacation and I put it in here, you know, make sure I mention it was we took this, I'm, I'm pretty sure it was 18 days. I could be wrong, but that's what it felt like when I was a kid. It was an 18 day motorhome road trip and my dad sold RV buys for auto trader so he was always around RVs. I had RVs in my life always. I mean, for age, I was little till I graduated, you know, RV. He was the number one salesman for Auto Trader RV buys and went to work for a recycler, number one salesman for them for years and years, um, which is pretty much just Auto Trader owned by LA Times. I was around them all my whole life, going to places with him and seeing these motorhomes. My, they had this awesome idea to go on this trip, and it was between school years in the summer when most kids want to be hanging out with their friends, doing stuff. And I had a girlfriend, a pretty serious girlfriend at the time. So it was like, I wasn't too excited about it. And then it just like became this crazy trip. <laughs> it 
like we took a motorhome out somewhere and the AC died. So they brought us another motorhome, put them side by side. And if you've ever been anywhere with my parents, like they bring the whole house every time they go anywhere, they come visit us. Like they bring their whole house. So the yep. motorhome had the motor home had our whole entire house in it. So we transferred <laughs> all that from one motor home, parked them next to each other with the steps next to each other into the other motor home. So that was a part of it. And then it was just like every other night, it felt like to me, we would set up camp. And again, setting up camp with my parents is extravagant. It's not like, let's start a little fire with some chairs. It's like, roll out this big carpet, all this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> it's all this like, let's make this like we're living at home, which is... Which <laughs> Like, can, we, can we just go back home? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> exactly. So it was like, you know, this crazy, almost every other night. My dad probably tells, I remember it being basically me and him doing the whole thing ourselves almost every time. He seems to think he did a lot more than I did, which is probably true at being a kid. But it was like every day doing this whole thing, putting it in, going somewhere else. But my brothers were little and they didn't really do much. So it was like, <laughs> all right, every freaking time I had to do this. So. You know, it was, but it was, it was a cool experience. Now that I think about it, I went to, you know, Mount Rushmore, saw the presidents and went to Yosemite, got to see Buffalo, all kinds of cool animals. And we did some cool stuff. But when you're in, I think I was a junior almost, I think it was between sophomore and junior year right before I met you. So like, it's not really what you want to do when you're, you're going to be a junior in high school, but I, you know, it's really cool. They've always made a real big effort to to do that and create memories. And obviously I still remember it. So <laughs> I think your dad genuinely gets pleasure out of either the, the RV or the boat not working correctly <laughs> and you have to get the tool bag out or you got to uh, change the tire. Yeah. And I think when everyone's bummed about it, he, he, secretly... <laughs> he, he takes it on as like, come on, this is part of the experience. Like, right. I could, t he's so, they're so organized in these vacations that I could see this being in the itinerary where it's like, okay, we're going to stop at Yosemite and the next we're going to get a oh, flat. Oh, it was totally. And yeah. I'm going to change, <laughs> Ty I'm going to show Tyler how to change the flat. Like I could totally uh, see that happening for yeah, sure. Yeah. Yeah. It was funny. Man. Oh yeah. That trip was definitely all laid out. I don't know about the, the AC breaking down. But. <laughs> it was a crazy trip, but that was always fun, man. That, that's my favorite memories growing up is those trips and really you know, my mom is very important to me with those talks and, and she taught me a lot of stuff. My dad is really kind of my hero, man, in a lot of ways. And, you know, I don't tell him it enough and I should tell him more, but his life, man, you know, being raised much differently than mine, he's very poor. My grandma was, my grandma was really awesome when, when I came in the picture and we were like, I spent a lot of time with her. She died of Parkinson's and some other stuff before that. She was pretty crazy. Pentecostal jumping up and down, beat you in the head Bible lady. So, you know, they were raised very poor. My dad's father was never around, you know, like my, my grandpa, I don't even know. I didn't really know him. So it's, you know, he had three stepdads or something like that. A lot of weird stuff like that. And so he got into some trouble, you know, obviously as a kid, not being paid much attention to, got in heavily into drugs. I won't tell the whole story, but you know, even some crazy stuff, PCP, LSD, these crazy drugs, you know, you gotten some pretty crazy stories, which I actually really have come to appreciate these stories even more again, like that I'm older and just hearing the choices he made to get out of it. But, you know, his, he went to jail for almost a year being involved with drugs and told, told us lots of crazy stories about jail, being scared and different things. There was a point in his life where, you know, I won't tell the whole story, but basically he had this like come to Jesus moment and he was on drugs and kind of basically said like if you get me out of this situation god you know i won't i won't ever go back and he did it it's, it's pretty impressive like straight up stopped it decided to be a different person i remember it, you know, he talks about coming out of jail and working at this bread factory and i don't know how in he, utah in utah I, remember this. <laughs> I don't know if he thinks if he knows that i think the story is as cool as i do but i think the bread story is one of my favorite stories because it's like this guy comes out of prison, works his butt off, works his way up this line. You're stacking bread all day long, like off a machine. But to him, it was like this new life and new way of like escaping his world, which I, I will really say appreciate. most people listening to this don't know your dad. <laughs> no. <laughs> and he had to have been the 
fastest, most aggressive, take all the overtime oh, yeah. bread person there was I'm just because sure. he's <laughs> the most hardcore individual that, that I know. Yeah, everybody, everybody else probably hated him because he made him work harder. <laughs> Damn, dude, <laughs> slow down. This is bread right? for just Utah, not <laughs> the whole entire country. <laughs> slow down, man. Right. <laughs> but I remember telling me this story about my grandma praying for him every day. I know that means a lot to him when he was in jail and like she would stand up in, in the middle of church and, you know, tell everybody to pray for my son, Ronnie and found God in his own way, got clean, stayed that way. Obviously it's a much you know more difficult, longer story that it's not my story to tell, but you know, he promised himself, which is a similar, I think to your story that he would raise his family much differently than he was raised. And I'm very grateful for that because he's, he's incredible and the way we were raised is nothing, nothing like that. He changed the whole mentality. He broke the cycle of crappy lives for the Rasmussen name. You know, he changed our entire lineage with choices he made, which is impressive. I never once saw him do a drug or take a drink of alcohol until after I was 18. You know, he does still doesn't, never did drugs, but, you know, I, he drinks every once in a while now. But I never, ever saw that. So he made an effort to really not teach us those things. I mean, he, he let me drink a beer when I was 12, so I would hate it, which I did, which I guess that worked. So. <laughs> <laughs> but he gave me some weird, nasty Budweiser, <clears throat> probably on purpose. Shit. I know. <laughs> if he'd have given that to you now, you'd still hate it. I still hate it. <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty impressive, man. And we'll get more into your story, but I think they, they have similarities and both of you to me, your stories are incredible and, and I wouldn't be, I'm not, I'm not who I am without him. So he truly is my hero in a lot of ways and changed our entire lineage, changed everything. He also spent a lot of time teaching me life skills, which I really did not enjoy as a young kid working on cars and mowing lawns and changing tires and fixing things around the house. Irrigation. But, irrigation. Yeah. Running whole freaking sprinkler systems together. I remember seeing you run around <laughs> with a, a basket full of plumbing. And uh-huh. <laughs> yeah. But I really appreciate those things now, man, because in, and Megan, my wife does too, because I can do pretty much anything around the house whenever I want to, which saves us a lot of money. And I, I know how to do it. I'm handy with all those things It helped. Obviously it helped me in, in pool repairs. I mean, I'm very, good with tools and things. And I learned all that from him. So he made a very good effort to teach us those things. And I'm very thankful for that. It was a big piece, man. And you know, we'll, we'll talk more about it when we get to our story. But from that point, I was kind of raised up in the church. My faith is a big part of who I am. It always will be and has been. So, and I think regardless of what you believe, growing up in church has a lot of benefits. A lot of teaches you amazing life skills, you know, like ethics, morals, values, and treating people like you want to be treated. And there's a lot of good in that, regardless of whatever you believe. I was raised around all that. And my mom always had such a sweet like spirit and taught us manners and how to respect people and how to treat a woman, which I don't think a lot of people understand. And I'm not talking about the equality stuff. I'm just like being compassionate and treating them correctly, opening doors for a lady and treating them with respect, things like that, that I think is missed on some some of this newer world. And I appreciate all of that because it is, and my kids are very respectful and very well-mannered too. And I think that's a, it's a big, big piece to be in this world and how you get a good jobs, how you accomplish things in life. You understand how to talk to people, how to treat people. I'm very good at writing emails. I'm very good at, at speaking, you know, in written form to people. And it's like, it, a lot of that is because of her and because of the way I was raised. So I'm very grateful for that too. You know, I went to Sunday school as a kid, been in church my whole life. I went to Christian school, like we talked about on the Lion episode from preschool till I graduated, which is pretty crazy. Seven of us did that. You know, like I said, I had pictures of us on some preschool little ponies up until we got these little things at graduation. So pretty crazy. But I was raised in a pretty Pentecostal charismatic church which if you don't know what that means, it's kind of like the jumping up and down, dancing flags and all kinds of praise and worship, which I respect. But it comes with kind of its own expectations when you're raised like that. And I always felt like I had to kind of live up to this, you know, expectation. And 
but being raised in a family like that too. And with, with a dad like that, that pushes you wants the best for you. Doesn't want you to end up like him. There's a lot of weight put on your shoulders and a lot of expectations and a lot of, it's, it's very, it's a very difficult thing to carry, you know, as a young kid with everybody always expecting you to be the good kid because that's what I was. And, you know, I obviously I make mistakes. I'm not saying I don't, but I tried really hard to not. I've, I've had very good discernment and intuition from a, ver- from a young age, since like age 11 or 12. I always knew which friends to pick, who to not hang out with. To see that person's a troublemaker, I'm not going to put myself around that. I learned not to put myself in situations to make mistakes, which has been very, very vital for my whole life. And I think if, if you can learn one lesson from me, like that should be it because who you, who you surround yourself with and the situations you put yourself in make many of those choices for you, even if you don't want to do it. So I learned from a very young age and I think that was part of my parents, part of my bringing, but I just, I just wanted to be a good person. Yeah. I always wondered what you went through in life to be the person that you were. Cause when we had, when I started there, we'll get into it. Um, we had chapel um, mm-hmm. every day at the Christian school. And I remember you just always smiling and talking to people and you were always in the front of the chapel room and your hands were up and you were totally genuine and into it. And I just, I never seen anything like it. And I just thought it was the, um, craziest thing in the world. And now that we're older and, you know, we're kind of reflecting on the past a little bit, Mm. kind of wondered what the hell does somebody go through in life (laughs) to get to that point at such a young age, you know, you see older people that are that way. Sure. But for, you know, a teenager to be that way, that, that is something completely different. Yeah. It's definitely a choice I made at a young age and what you bring up in chapel, like even had to me, that was, it was a choice I made to be a leader at a young age and a, and a burden I didn't know I took on. I think when that happened, I made those choices to go up to the front and be that leader. I didn't really know I was taking on kind of the whole school or the whole Christian reputation that came with that. I just really wanted to work on myself and God. And it kind of led to that, which again led to a whole nother like expectation of me to be that person and to make that effort every time. So even if I was having a bad day or I just got in a fight and then it was Thursday and it was chapel day, like I had to make that choice to go up to the front and be that person because I felt like I had the whole school on my shoulders at some point. I mean, there's obviously other kids that were into it too, but it was a lot of times if I didn't go up first, a lot of people didn't go up. I'm not saying that to be prideful. I'm just saying like, I, I think I didn't know I was taking that burden on when it first happened, but then it just kind of became a thing of everybody expects Tyler to be up there. And if Tyler's not up there, something's wrong. And that was hard for me to carry. That's a big piece of me. And I enjoyed that. And it was real and true and honest. Like you said, it's a very heavy burden to carry and be that person. Our stories are much different. You know, the things we carried our our insecurities are much different, but they're, they're there for everybody. I think everybody has their own insecurities and everybody has their own struggles and problems that they deal with. And you're dealt the hand you're dealt with. And you don't really have a choice in a lot of that, you know, when you're at a young age, which who your parents are, how you're going to be raised, but everybody does have their own things. And for someone who's raised up in a church, and like I said, with those parents and my parents are amazing, but they're, I was expected to get A's and B's. C was, a C was not good enough. You know, it was, I was expected to be good and not make bad mistakes. You know, like you said, you said before in some of these episodes, like my dad's famous line is make good choices, which I'll never forget and always do and think of. So it's my it, favorite. Yeah. I say it to my, I say it to my daughters and say it all the time. It's so simple but there's so much meaning behind it yeah for sure you get this reputation of being a goody two-shoes per se being the one that always is good and that comes with like i said a burden but it comes like with everybody watching you all the time because you're making a, a conscious effort to be a good person when when some people aren't they're looking at you and saying it can't be true you can't be that good and they're just waiting for you to fail and the minute I fail, 
I always felt like everybody was just saying, see, told you it wasn't good enough. Told you you couldn't be that person. You know, that's, that's what I lived with for, for many, many years. It was very hard. A lot of burden, a lot of weight on my shoulders. I saw that firsthand with you from the very beginning. I honestly don't, I still don't know how you did it because you were under the microscope and there was a lot of people that were probably rooting for you to, to screw yeah. up because you're not even the person like now that you were back then mm-hmm. you're still good. You're a different version of that, but you know, we were in a small school where your dad was on the board, so many different things going on where it's kind of funny. Me and you were on different uh, sides of the spectrum. Mm-hmm. It was expected for me to rebel, uh, act out a little bit, but it was definitely um, expected of you to always do the right thing for somebody not doing the right thing for you to interject and make it right. Like that was definitely your role. So it was like the smallest thing. Yeah. Even if I ever heard something like, oh, did you hear it? Like Titus and that, but like, who gives a shit? That's like, the, <laughs> that's like the smallest like thing in the world. Like, yeah, gives a shit. <laughs> he ordered an extra taco from Del Taco. <laughs> Guy's human. Give him a freaking break. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But that, I mean, that led to a lot of internal issues for me that I don't really talk much about. Probably only three people have ever heard me talk about this piece of it. I mean, it's very, I keep it very close knit to my chest because it's not, I don't believe in making excuses for things. I just want to be who I am. And I think, you know, it's not a story I tell everybody. So it's, it led to a lot of internal issues. I beat myself up mentally a lot. And I see that in my kids sometimes. And I'm like, dude, don't like, it's okay to make mistakes. Like it's all that matters is how you come out of those mistakes. Like, I don't want my kids to think that they can't make a mistake because I hated that feeling. I beat myself up mentally all the time and, you know, telling myself I'm not good enough. You know, why even try? Don't do this. Don't do that. You know, it's, it's very, very difficult inside to feel like you're not good enough, even though (laughs) I think I was pretty good kid. Right. But it's like that, but that comes again with just carrying this thing. And I had gave me a ton of anger issues that I think, I had to work through not as bad as yours, which we'll get into, but <laughs> it did give me a ton of, a ton of anger issues. Like, you know, I used to go and I would like punch the bathroom, uh, paper towel thing sometimes. And just like to, to relieve frustration where nobody could see me or go in, and I would just throw things and break things. And I always try to do it privately and people didn't see me, but like, it was very, very hard for me to shake and break that. I saw it on the, football field and uh, <laughs> sure. basketball courts. Mm-hmm. I kind of just, I saw that that was like a different side because of your competitive nature. Yeah. So you were probably um, thankful to be on the football field or the basketball court. Cause yeah. it's almost like for a very competitive person that can be accepted to a certain degree. Mm-hmm. Whereas, you know, just acting out, uh, <laughs> Like maybe I would or something in the middle of class or something, but yeah. you were very competitive. Yeah. <laughs> My whole, that's a Rasmussen sports, thing for sure. Sports are a very uh, <laughs> big part of your life for all of you. Yeah. I mean, I grew up playing all kinds of sports. I think you're right. It was kind of a release for me for a lot of those angers and I could be kind of a different person out there and I could hide some of that aggression and hide some of that uh, pain and feeling in and release it on other teams and things like that, that people probably didn't notice as much. But, you know, like I said, I, I think being dealt the good hand in life comes with a lot of judgment, comes with a lot of expectations and it's difficult. And people probably don't think it's that difficult because they just see you have a a nice life and nice things. And, you know, what can, you know, what, what can go wrong with Tyler that, you know, he has everything and I have nothing. And, I felt like that judged like that a lot. I thought that until I got to know you. Yeah. I mean, you, everybody judges a book by its cover, but it's like, must be nice (laughs) to have the cool looking truck and to have, you know, the nice caring parents and all this stuff. And all your brothers were super cool and very 
kind from day one, you don't realize there's a price to pay for that because I won't go too far into it, but having to having to go back to your parents, especially your dad, if something didn't go the way that it was supposed to, <laughs> that was always that was always something that was uh, very very difficult because yeah. you're the first you're the first child and you could see there was a lot expected of you right. in every way imaginable. Yeah. Yeah, man, going back to, I, I think disappointment to me is by far, by far the worst thing for anybody to be disappointed in me has always been. That word disappointment hurts me very deeply more than anything, I think. Like, that's what I don't like doing with disappointing people. It's, that's always been the same way growing up. It's everything, it's all the... <laughs> Disappointment is to me the hardest thing to get over. Being the firstborn, and I know with my firstborn, you have these expectations. You, they're the kind of the guinea pig of everything. You you learn, you try things. It works. It doesn't work. You know your next kids get a little bit different treatment. And you your know, brothers are awesome, but they, they definitely had a major shade. <laughs> yeah, I mean, <laughs> we'll get. I'm sure we'll get into some of the stuff we did together. But yeah, we mowed lawns. As soon as we left, like my dad just bought or hired a long guy. I'm like, <laughs> oh, that's cool. You didn't have to do that very long, did you? So like, yeah, there's a lot, <laughs> lots of stuff like that that were just, you know, yeah, it just comes with the territory and I'm fine with that. And I've learned through my faith and through my wife, family, you, best friend, and I've learned to love and accept myself. And it's taken me 15 years and I still, I think, fight some of those demons you know, not expecting too much of myself, not trying to put too much pressure on myself and trying to live in the moments. I've really been focusing on that the last couple of years of just trying to be here and be present and enjoy my world, enjoy my family, enjoy what we're doing here. Cause I don't, you know, who knows? I don't know what my next step step is going to be or my family's next step is going to be. And I've learned to be okay with some of those insecurities and, hopefully not pass them to my kids and teach them differently. I think growing up in a family like that and a religion and church like that, there's a lot of good in it. And then there's pieces that I don't want to take. And I think that's what everybody should do. You know, you take the good pieces of your childhood, you take the good pieces of what you've learned from your friends, your mentors, your family, and you try to, you know, implement those. And then things you didn't like so much, you you try to change that in your kids and, change the way you treat them at least that's what I think good parents should do is try to really give your kids you know a whole nother experience give them the good or don't give them the bad like in your case you know give them what you want to give them and try to take that but I had a I had a pretty amazing 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 life with amazing parents and I wouldn't change anything I think the biggest thing that comes out of it like don't judge people kind of by their cover because and we talk about it a lot. Like we, we talked about when, with customers, when you're talking to a customer and you're, you're, they're going through a hard time if they're giving you a bunch of crap over something, like you don't really know what happened. Maybe their whole family just died in a car accident yesterday and now you're dealing, you got a pool issue and they could care less, but they're lashing out on you. Something like that. You just don't know what people are going through and what they're dealing with. So I think our story, and we'll get, I can get into it, is a very great example of just like, not judging a book by its cover. And I think being around you, I got to not really wear that mask, which is pretty awesome. And I think we, we just, I just, we just realized this a couple of days ago when we were talking about it. I think I didn't have to wear the mask around you and being at home in that back apartment, like you weren't my parents. You weren't every kid that judged me. You weren't in my life for a lot long at that point. So you didn't know, you didn't really know any of that history of me and you didn't really know much other than what I showed you. So I got to just be me with you and we don't really have a lot in common, which we'll get into. <laughs> <laughs> so like the fact that we're best friends is pretty crazy. And I, but I do think that, you know, that realization the other day is a, is a pretty good one that we could just be ourselves around each other and we didn't have to be that person that everybody expected us to be and vice versa. And we just had a lot of fun being me. And when I graduated, I moved to Arizona, which kind of leads us to Arizona and brothers. But 
you know, I took that as an opportunity to kind of have a clean slate, I guess, you know, allowed me to move past my last, my past relationship, some of that drama, you know, I had some, some stuff I didn't really want to be part of Victorville anymore. I kind of was over it <laughs> and, you know, went to master's commission, which for people that don't know is kind of like a nine month discipleship where students come from all over kind of the country. We stay with like a host family for nine months, learn, study the Bible, you know, get involved heavily with youth groups. We travel and talk to youth groups in schools. So it's a lot of cool stuff to get to do and be a part of. And I got to be who I wanted to be and be me, which was one of the first times in a long time where I got to just, nobody knew who I was. So, and I don't think I was ever putting on a facade per se, but I didn't have to live up to those expectations anymore. Nobody had expectations for me, you know, not the same ones anyways. Yeah. You were on track to going to master's commission, which I'm glad you cleared that up because I never explained that very well. I say that you were a, a missionary. <laughs> yeah. Well, you people know, Ty, say it's man, like a Mormon mission. <laughs> He put the helmet on. He's got the <laughs> the white Oxford shirt. He's he's taken on the world. No, I'm just kidding. But there's a lot of things that can't really talk about on the podcast. But you know, our world was kind of flipped upside down. Um, yeah. We had lost somebody close and different things like that. Yeah. And I'm sure that it was probably a mix of that and everything else you know going on in your life. And we were just talking about that, that that must have really felt good, you know, moving to a different state where you could just start over and nobody knows, you know, who you were back in Victorville. There's nothing like that. It's time for Tyler to just start with a fresh slate and, mm -hmm. and be yourself. Yeah, man. It was a really cool experience because I, I had a lot of fun, <laughs> to be honest. It could just, I didn't have to, I didn't have to be this person people wanted me to be. And I got to show my real personality, which I married Megan and she was part of that. Like, I don't know that she would have ever seen my real personality had I not been there. Like if we had met when I was in California, I don't know that it would have been shown. So that's really cool. I got a lot, you know, I, moved, I live with the Harlands here to me. They took me in like their own kid. I mean, I still call Kim my Arizona mama. Like she, I still go to dinners with them. You know, even it's been, phew, 12 or 13 years now or something, we still go to dinners. So there's cool stuff. I changed a lot in these next two years, which led me to brothers and some other things. You know, it's learned how to, how to lead people differently, which I think helped a lot in running a company and dealing with people. I credit this time in my life as kind of like a pivotal moment for me to become more of like a man and how to treat people correctly. I think growing up the way I did and I was never really handed everything, but my parents took very good care of us. I mean, I had vehicles all the time when on family trips, vacations, I earned it. I mean, we, we learned, we did a lot of stuff. I, I worked on cars, did this. And I mean, I was taught, like I said, but I did have a good life. So there's a, a little bit of a cockiness that comes with that. I think For that sure. I had, that I had going into masters, a little California kid with a crooked hat, all probably looked like a doofus to these people out here. <laughs> Upside down, flipped baby blue beanie. I was going to say, just leave the, the baby blue dickies at home, the Carmelo jersey. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, I had this little, I did have a little cockiness and kind of self-centered for a little bit. This changed my whole world, man, because a month into it, like I went to Katrina Katrina had just happened like eight, eight or nine months before that. So it was pretty fresh. And I went, we took a road trip from here to New Orleans. That's a long trip. <laughs> um, and like a month into it, man, it was like quick. So I'm out there. We're eating food in this like bubble that they just create. They just throw these bubble tents up with food that they feed everybody that's helping out. And this lady comes in kind of like, frantically asking for help and i remember our, our director like me and i think actually make yeah i think megan was there with me so me megan and i think three other people went to this lady's house and we followed her in this truck and like her house was completely gone there was like these really old ancient wood floors and her like great 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 grandpa like installed these floors in like 1920 something like crazy old house 
and that was all that was left of her whole house. We pulled the boards up. We like bleached them out. I forget what we, you know, we, we probably we did something to help store them. I forget what it was. It was, it meant so much to her, these little floorboards. <laughs> and I'm this little 18 year old kid that got handed, you know, not handed, but I got, had a really good life. And for her to like care so much about these floorboards changed a lot for me perspective on life changed real quick you know when with what's actually important it's something to, <laughs> something i'll never forget that's for sure well that's real life shit right there you know they just went through this major storm that just ripped their cities apart and these are people that already don't have much and this storm just took everything yeah the little things that they do have ripped to shreds mm-hmm Yeah, I remember you telling me about that. It's extremely sad, but I think that that is definitely probably a rude awakening for you in that, wow, like there's a lot of people out here that that really don't have much. Yeah. They don't, if they get in a pinch or, you know, their house blows over or something like that, like there's no lifeline. There's not anyone for them to fall back on. There's none of that. It's crazy, man. It's it's a different. I mean, I learned a lot of that from you, and we'll get into our story. You helped me see that, you know, already. But being there with like wood floorboards being that important was pretty crazy to see. I think another big thing I learned from that was was servanthood. And I think a lot of people think of that as like you're serving somebody, but to me, like servanthood is is caring for people, and that's to me what what Jesus is all about, and what my faith in me is is what I believe is caring about people. And I learned to kind of put other people first, which wasn't my life for sure at 18, 19 years old. You know, we would, we would feed people, feed the homeless or, or have events where people would eat and we had to eat last no matter what. There were several times I didn't get to eat anything because all the food was already gone. I mean, we, we cleaned up everything. We were the last ones to leave all the time, you know, after everybody left and been at home sleeping, we're still cleaning up and there's just, pieces of that that are very to me impactful at a young age of if you learn how to serve somebody man and you learn how to do it right you learn how to put somebody else before you and not be selfish that's a big big thing i learned in that and it was really cool because to me jesus i won't talk about too much religion but it's a big piece of who i am and and probably i think a big piece of why we're friends so i'll talk a little bit to me that jesus served people he loved on people you know, he didn't hang out with Pharisees. He hung out with like the sinners and the prostitutes and these people that needed him and needed to be saved and needed to be loved on and cared for. To me, God is like a God of love and God of mercy and not really fire and brimstone, which is what I was raised with Pentecostal stuff. It's not, to me, it's not that. It's more about the mercy and love. And I learned a lot of that through masters and it's a lot different than I learned through, you know, being raised in a Pentecostal church. So it's not really, the way I've always looked at it, it's not really my place to judge others i think that's god's day on judgment day you know that's it's not my i don't need to judge people so it's my job to really show god's love and show compassion for people and i'm not perfect by any means i don't think i am i make mistakes just like everybody else but i believe in trying to lead by example and trying to you know show that the best i can through my life and it's it's worked really well for me because and I think it's worked well for our friendship. Like I don't have to thrust this Jesus thing in people's faces. It's always been a part of me. It's very important to me. And I've always tried to lead by example. And it's always led to these relationships with people that are unique because I probably shouldn't be friends with some of these people or be in these people's lives, but God's kind of put them in my life as like, to plant a seed, which I learned in masters too, of kind of like some people are in my life for a season. Some people are in my life forever, but I need to be a good example for those people when they're in my life. So it's always worked really well of me just being a happy person and me crediting Jesus for that and God for that. And people always come up to me and ask me, you know, why don't you go to that party or why don't you do this? And then I get to tell the story. And so for me, that's, that's really cool because I don't need to throw it in people's faces. It's never been my MO. And I think it's honestly probably why you were brought into my life and why we're friends. You know, why it's that piece of it is that that compassion for others and 
me being a part of your life at that young pivotal age, like it's very, very important to me. It always has been. And I think it's why you and I are so close or a piece of it anyways. Definitely. So kind of wrap up a little bit my story here. I mean, I met, I met Megan, my wife there, obviously, you know, we talked, we did episode 50 together. You can hear some more story on there, but you know, and I met her and one of my other best friends, Ryan, and I've never met really anybody like these two because growing up, I didn't really have someone to relate to like in this biblical side that I was really into. And I could connect with them on a different level, just different than, than I had experienced before. So I got really close with them, which was really cool, refreshing to finally have friends who kind of understood that piece of me. And, you know, you and I have always been best friends and really close, but we don't talk much about that. There's pieces of that, that, that I connect better with other people. It was cool to have that around. They've both been very important and they still are important influences in my life. You know, I married Megan in 2009, you know, my best friend, favorite person in the whole world to be around. And you know, we got married here in Scottsdale because that's where we kind of developed our life after masters. Um, had my son Maddox, you know, in February of 2012, again, completely changed my life. I mean, I never knew that you could love something so much. And I think our children have a big part in mind in your life, which we'll talk about later, but it's, it's, uh, <laughs> being a dad is my favorite thing in the whole world. And it's really cool. And I had Max in, in, in 2016 again overwhelmed with I think you always like when you have your first kid you don't think you can love anything anymore and then you have your second kid and it's like a different love but you love them the same and people always you know we talk about not having favorites and it's a joke but you just love them the same amount but in different ways so it's it's really cool to to be and it's my favorite part of my whole life my family is the reason I work so hard they mean the world to me you know, our businesses together, our two families, like to me is what I think about all the time every day when I work hard is, is my four and your four. Um, I've talked about it several times. I told you all, we, we talk about all the time, it's you and me versus the world. And I really genuinely believe that, you know, at the end of the day, it's about taking care of us eight to me and us eight is what matters. And that's what's mattered through thick and thin, through brothers, through pool chasers, through everything we do in our lives and our family is it's that. And I can't be more blessed and grateful for, for where we're at. So that's kind of my, my story up until that point. We'll get into how we met after, after you tell yours. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you, Tyler. That was awesome. And uh, a little long winded, but we'll get, no, this episode's awesome, man. I I really, (laughs) I think it's going to be cool to tell people. And I, I think your story next ties in it's completely different and ties into where we are today so yeah tell it here at pool chasers we're all about sharing information so that you can become even more knowledgeable pool professionals the folks at pentair get that and to show their appreciation we invite you to enroll in the pentair partners incentive program this flexible and simple program rewards you for your loyalty starting with your very first sale of pentair equipment or systems not only that but being a partner gives you immediate and exclusive access to programs and training events, all which are developed to help drive even more business to your door. So to start earning rewards, visit pentairpartners.com or click the link in the write-up below. This all starts with my aunt that introduced my dad to my mom in Baker, California. Oh, yeah. World's largest thermometer. Yep. <laughs> So she uh, introduced my dad to my mom and they hit it off and had me and they split up and my mom was getting ready to have me. So she went to the nearest hospital, which was in Barstow, California. Mm. And that's where I was born. Good old old Barstow. Good old Barstow. (laughs) So that's where I was. That's where I was born. So right after that, moved to um, Bellflower, California which is where the majority of my mom's side of the family lives. And I don't remember every little thing, but we lived in a trailer park. It was um, my little brother, Matt, and my mom. And from the pictures I've seen, it looked like uh, life was okay. You know, we're 
eating oranges. I'm on a skateboard shredding over <laughs> speed <Shocker>. bumps <laughs> at a very young age. Um, so we did that not too long after, um, moved to a duplex in Bellflower, actually right around the corner on Alondra and Cornuda in Bellflower. What I do remember is that this was a, this was a very difficult time in this area because we're in between Los Angeles and Long Beach. And this was a time that, you know, the Long Beach riots, the LA riots and all of that stuff. So every night it was uh, helicopters over the top of your house. There's people running from the cops. So they're, we were in a duplex. So they were running, you know, over the top of your house, had metal bars on all the windows because they were obviously trying to hide somewhere, trying to kick in the window, whatever it may be. Wasn't Rodney King riot in that area or something? Yeah. Yeah. It was all yeah. pretty. So when they kind of, you know, made the verdict or whatever with uh, Rodney King, it just all hell broke loose. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I remember playing soccer and there would just be, you know, a group of 20, 30 people and they would just be fighting like crazy. Somebody was getting jumped in a gang or they were just, there was just so much going on. There was one time that a fight broke out and it just like rolled right into our practice and everybody's freaking out and, you know, we all go our separate ways. That's what it was at that time in life. So we lived there. You know, one thing I do remember is somebody was trying to break into our house. You know, they were banging on the door. They were wiggling the handle and it's pretty crazy. I remember my mom saying, Greg, go get the shotgun. <laughs> And I knew that she had one, but I didn't, I couldn't get to it or anything like that. Um, she was just trying to scare this dude and he took off, but it was pretty regular that, you know, our mail was getting stolen or some kind of ruckus was going on because we were kind of the head sort of duplex right there on Cornuta. Yeah. So you got the main street right there where just a ton of stuff is going on. I remember you showed me a picture of the the world view or something on your computer. Oh too, yeah. Not, yeah. Not too long ago. <laughs> On Google Earth or whatever. Yeah, fun, <laughs> fun place. <laughs> so the funny thing is my my aunt and uncle actually lived. It's a long driveway that goes past probably five duplexes that are all connected. My aunt and uncle lived at the one in the very back. And they had a swimming pool. You know, it's all exposed. There's like this big fence all blocked off. But you go through the fence and then there's the pool and then there's the house and different things like that. I've talked about it before, but, you know, this is something I'll, I'll never forget. I had a family gathering there. We were always kind of getting together with the family. And I walked out of uh, my aunt's front door. First thing I see is my little brother um, laying face down in the swimming pool. Yeah. I was super young, but that's uh, something that's stained in my brain. And I remember being so young, I couldn't even, I couldn't even I was uh, in shock. I could barely move. I couldn't talk. I was just terrified. You know, your little brother, this is yeah. this is somebody that you're taking care of. So I run to the side where my family's at, and I'm kind of yelling and pointing at the pool. And I remember it was like slow motion. Everybody dropped their wine glasses, and I just remember the the sound of glass breaking on the, on the ground. Mm -hmm. And my uncle jumped in. He dove in the pool, got him out put them on the deck and uh i don't know how the uh ambulance got there so fast but they did and you know brought my little brother back to life and that was that was amazing because that was my little that was my little buddy so they brought him back and unfortunately you know he had a lot of hearing issues so it wasn't it was pretty common for him to you know, have a lot of pain in his ears. Mm -hmm. um, stuff was coming out, spent a lot of time in like FHP and hospitals, stuff like that, because he would have these issues in the middle of the night and different things like that. So spent a lot of time dealing with that. So shortly after, you know, we're making notes of all this stuff and stuff. And I thought that this was actually something that was also around this time that was pretty crazy in 94, O.J. Simpson was in his white Bronco <laughs> running from the cops. <laughs> yeah. um, you know, this is 94, was born in 86. 
I'm not too familiar with who OJ Simpson is right. at this point in time. Yeah. Um, but we lived in Bellflower and we were going to visit my, my grandpa and his wife in uh, Santa Ana. And as anybody might know, that's pretty much the path OJ was on yep. while this was all happening. <laughs> and I just remember we were driving down the freeway and it, it seemed like a hundred cars, a hundred cop cars were just flying past us. And it was just, it was pretty crazy. I never seen so many cop cars. I mean, I'm getting used to seeing a lot of uh, right, right. cop cars and ambulances and stuff, but this was more than usual for sure. Um, and we finally get to my, my grandpa's house in Santa Ana and he always used to hang out in the backyard. He had these, you know, huge trees that just sort of shaded the whole entire backyard. And he used to watch his TV back there. He had a little TV. He would just kind of sit on the lawn chair and just hang out. He was kind of a little bit more reserved dude. Super cool, but definitely more of a introvert. And mm -hmm. it's just like, you guys see OJ out there? <laughs> like, what? <laughs> I just remember this conversation. He's like, I'm, just, I'm watching it right now. He just went down the freeway. The cops are after him. And we're like, oh, shit. Like, that's... Yeah. He, yeah. He flew right past us. <laughs> like cops did anyway. I don't know. They're they're after him. So yeah. um that was, you know, pretty uh crazy stuff. Yeah, I know it's I mean, back to your brother, man. I, I think, you know, your brother's always been pretty important to you and I think that, that story is pretty impactful. I've heard you tell it before. Both of our all of our brothers have been I didn't really mention them in my story too much in the beginning, but they're all really important to us and you know, they're, like you said, there are, there are buddies and our friends and I, you know, at least for my sake, as we've grown older, I've gotten closer with them, which has been cool, but I know you've always cared about your brother a lot and it's, yeah, you know, that him going through that, I think has led to a lot of the other stuff, you know, you've gone through with him. So, but you've always looked out for him, which I, which I always respected, you know, you took care of him. Yeah. There's a handful of people that I'm extremely protective over, not too many, outside of my family, my little brother at that time. And if you're listening to this, Matt, I'd love a relationship with you, dude, because I think um, it's important to say that these are things that happen. It's protective of my little brother. And unfortunately, you know, we don't, we don't talk, you know what I mean? And I do think it's important for people to understand like how, how short life is mm -hmm. and, you know, something that, I learned a lot from your dad that's not so easy is it, you know, we have to learn to, to forgive one another, no matter who's in the right or wrong, but to have that on your conscience is it's really such a burden that you got to hold on your, on your back. And that's, uh, it's pretty tricky. Right. So that's all going on. I mean, it's, uh, can't think, I couldn't think of everything cause it, it was a roller coaster of a life, but I remember living in Bellflower, um, went to a lot of different, babysitters. I remember I was in the kindergarten and first day of school, I'm like dropped off at a babysitter <laughs> and I'm actually walking <laughs> to school my first day from the babysitter's oh, house man. in kindergarten uh, by myself. So kind of learned to be, I guess, kind of independent, you know, when you're young and going through it and you don't know any better, you're just kind of like, I got dropped off here this morning. The babysitter said that the school I need to go to I think about my daughter in kindergarten and it's pretty crazy to even think of her going to a babysitter and then just any, like any grade yeah. after that, walking to school after that. But, you know, these are things that, you know, make me who I am and define who I am. Yeah. So that babysitter, for whatever reason, didn't last too long and probably because you let you walk to school. <laughs> I was, at, I was at a lot of, I guess, you know, babysitters were hard to come by maybe in this area at the time. Yeah. Um, I was at another one and this is pretty crazy. Remember they had a really nice house. I don't know what city it was in, but playing out in the backyard and a um, little kid, you know, he's a few years older than me. I'm super young, you know, I'm kind of garden first grade or whatever and lights up a cigarette and his little, it's got like a little like, uh, I don't know, like a little treehouse looking thing, but it's on the ground and he's in there and he lights up a cigarette and I'm just like, whoa, dude. And he's like, <laughs> like, you know, you, you want one. And I, it just seems all bad. I mean, I can like barely breathe, you know, right. in right. this little area. And, um, you know, I tell my mom about, it. I'm like, Hey, like, <laughs> you know, 
probably because I smelled like smoke. I, right. I don't know. Right, probably. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so that that was the end of that. At this point, something happens. Um, I end up not going to the second grade. I'm not sure what happens in this year, but I end up not doing the second grade at all. And I'm sure it has something to do with me having to go live with my dad in Las Vegas. So I end up moving to Las Vegas and I do the third grade. And I still remember it was a very difficult time for me because I didn't understand anything that was going on because I had pretty much skipped an entire year of school and it was really hard to keep up. But this was a time that I got to connect with one of my best friends, which is my stepmom, Sam. She uh, she was there. She We lived in uh, this house in Vegas, wherever it was at the time. And I was with her the majority of the time. And she was just somebody that I don't know why. There are certain people that have come into my life. Sam was a very important person to me. She made sure that my homework was getting done. She didn't ask for any of this and all the issues that came along with it, but she, man, she loved me. She still does and took good care of me. It was an yeah. interesting time. There's a lot of other things can't really talk about on here, but it was rough. I remember walking home from the third grade because they all had to work and whatnot. You know, there'd be, uh, you know, uh, calls on the answering machine. Remember those things? Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. Uh, the blinking would, light when you come in the door. Exactly. <laughs> and I would hit that because, they, you know, dad, Sam, leave messages or something. Yeah. And most of the time it was, it was so difficult because it was usually my mom leaving a really nasty message. You know, she wanted me back in California and I wasn't there for whatever reason. And it was just saying some crazy shit to yeah. my dad and my stepmom and all this stuff. So getting through the third grade, we've got to go do the whole custody battle thing. This was difficult because the plan was for me to live with my dad and, you know, he invested money into kind of figuring this out and having me live with him. And we go to court in LA and my mom brings my entire side of my mom's family to court. You know, they're all kind of there and pretty much bribing a little kid, you know, with things will be different. These are the, this is the fun we're going to have and all these different things. I just got caught up in it. And when the judge asked who I wanted to live with, I sided with my mom. It was a choice that was made, you know, making choices at a, at a very young age. And that was a very long drive back to Vegas. My dad super confused it why I'd made that decision, but that's what it was. So at this time, I end up going back. And my mom now, things were getting really bad in Bellflower. And she, it's probably the best job that she had because we're always really poor growing up. So she had a job with State Farm Insurance. And I think it was the best job that she had had because I can't think of any other reason she was able to, to buy a house in Atalanto. But I always talk about people from Los Angeles moving up to the high desert <laughs> yeah. and it being what it is. Well, we were, we were definitely one of them. So at this time we're living in uh, the house in Atalanto and it's, it's very nice compared to being in Bellflower, but still had to go to school down there because she worked there. So we were commuting every day. I remember we were waking up at about four in the morning and you know, driving to uh, drop my brother off at daycare. I went to a program before school started and I went to that. And then we would do school and get picked up at, I was in the program after school because my mom was getting off. We would drive back to Atalanto and that was a very, it's a very far drive. Um, you wouldn't get there until the middle of the night, have dinner, go to bed super early. It's a very, Mom is a very uh, strict kind of religious woman. We couldn't watch anything but G-rated movies, black and white films. That's why <laughs> I I watch old Jimmy Stewart films and Danny yep. Kaye and Gregory Peck. And then if I was being real crazy when I went to my grandma's house, she always had some uh, 
old yeller. Alfred, Alfred Hitchcock. Uh, <laughs> Alfred Hitchcock. Had like psycho or birds or oh, something yeah. that would sneak through. <laughs> blood sport. No. Blood that's a, sport. <laughs> dude, I got caught up sick watching blood sport, which that's another crazy thing. My my grandma is someone special. She taught me how to throw a football at a young age and she bought me my first skateboard when oh, I was yeah, little. She's awesome. And she's uh she she's got a like a dojo in her house. Very yeah. small house in, in Norwalk, but she had like a like a dojo um where she teach us like different, you know, like different Taekwondo things yeah. that she had learned. <laughs> That's cool, man. <laughs> and nunchucks, all that, all that fun stuff. Yep. Didn't your mom, this is my favorite, your mom like cut videotapes and like put them back together to take out parts. <laughs> oh my gosh, dude. <laughs> dude. Like the, so, bad, the bad parts in the movie, she would cut the take, pull the tape, cut it and like piece it back together. Bro. <laughs> She could turn like Silence of the Lambs into a, a G-rated movie. <laughs> I'm not kidding. Yeah, so that's what my mom would do. Oh, like, if there was like a, a PG-rated <laughs> movie and we really wanted to watch it, she would she would watch these films like, I don't know, like a, a coach would or yeah. something and watch it. And when they said, oh, my God, she would take it out and she would clip that part. So all the movies... <laughs> All the movies we would watch were just like, and then it would like play, and they would, and it would play, and it was like, dude. I mean, we don't oh, know any better, but I mean, it was just, it was, it was crazy, and things were like very laxed. Um, living at my dad and with my stepmom when I lived there, and when I would visit, they didn't really care too much about like that stuff. So. Yeah. It was kind of uh, pretty polar opposites, actually. <laughs> polar opposites. So I think that's why, you know, my mom didn't want me there. And this is part of, you know, my confusing childhood of where I'm living in two different worlds. And it's just uh, it is it is what it is. So we're doing that for a while and end up. I'm not sure what happened but they open up a school actually in Atalanto and it, it's brand new and we end up going to this school. I think maybe it had to do with something with um, my brother starting kindergarten mm-hmm. so he could actually go to the school and different things like that. And one of the craziest memories I have is actually, I think the, the craziest thing is that I actually made the decision on my own to do the third grade over because I just, I remember having this conversation, we were driving in the car and I just said, you know what? I I had a really difficult time um, since I didn't do the second grade, whatever, but I need to do the third grade over. And when I was kind of writing down this memory, I was thinking about how crazy that decision was because if that hadn't happened, None of I wouldn't be sitting here today. I'm yeah. not even sure what would have happened because me and you never would have met. I would right. have been a grade, you know, uh, above Older. you and it's pretty, you know, crazy to think about that. So do the third grade over again. We go to this new school and at this time in my life, I remember being insanely obsessed. I don't know anybody. I've never even met kids in my life that were as obsessed with baseball the way that I was. I mean, I, I collected cards. I didn't see this anywhere um, in terms of like how to take care of cards, but like I was, they had to be mint. I had them like in, in order. I, I did the whole thing. The Beckett's. Yeah. <laughs> I broke in my hat. I mean, I, I would break in my glove. I took it everywhere. You're at the store. My, yeah. I slept with my baseball glove. I remember my first baseball bat. Got it from, I remember, got it from like a thrift store or whatever. But I named it Marcy. And <laughs> everything after that, like it was like Marcy 2, Marcy 3, Marcy 4. That's awesome. I don't know where the <laughs> hell that came from, but I do remember that. I remember I connected with a kid, his name was Matt, and he actually loved baseball almost as much as I did. And we played on a team together and we just, 
we we killed it. And we remember the following year we went to like tryouts or whatever where they're just trying to figure out what they're doing with the kids. And I remember we would like uh, put our glove on the opposite hand and we would do whatever it takes to look as crappy as we were because we wanted to get on a crappy team Mm -hmm. and have it the crappy team go all the way. (laughs) We wanted to be on the bad news bears and we wanted to take the bad news bears to like the big championship. Mm -hmm. The only crappy thing is we got put on two crappy opposite teams. (laughs) So we didn't get to play together. So we ended up kind of just being like rivals because our two crappy teams ended up doing pretty well. (laughs) I remember that. And he ended up uh, moving actually here to Arizona. And I visit him a couple of times, which that was really cool. But I I hung on to baseball for a bit. It wasn't until parents couldn't take me to practice anymore and different things like that where I got onto other things. But when I was doing the third grade at this new school, my brother was in kindergarten. I remember this young age, I'm having to take care of myself and my little brother. And, you know, he was a little bit behind in school, I think due to, you know, I don't know a hundred percent, but I'm sure it had something to do with Mm -hmm. him drowning and that having some effect on his brain. Right. But he definitely had a few issues. And I remember, he would get picked on a little bit and I was never, um, I kept to myself until I had to, until something came over me that I couldn't stop where I had to take care of it. And I was very protective over him. And I remember I was, uh, in my classroom one day and somebody ran in and said that, um, this kid that everybody knew in the school, he was like a couple grades older than us. His name was big John. <laughs> And uh, they said that my brother was in the, the bathroom and he kind of was talking crap to him and uh, was kind of pushing him around and messing with him and said that, you know, my brother cried or whatever. And I remember I just uh, was full of rage and I, I left the classroom. Teachers like, what were the heck is this kid going all right and i'm just in a full sprint and we had different lunches and all that kind of stuff and i figured if they were out at lunch on the recess playground whatever that he'd be out there so he was out there i'm probably half his size at this time but i remember i i kicked in his back knee and he just dropped to the ground i <laughs> took this tether, tether ball he, story tether oh. ball court I remember I I wrapped that tetherball thing around his neck and I just said some, I don't even know, man. I said some stuff to him and I ended (laughs) up getting uh, suspended. I might've been the first kid to get suspended from that school, but I got in a ton of trouble because, you know, growing up in sort of that strict house and that wasn't the way that you took care of things. And I listened to everybody, but hey, nobody ever messed with him ever again. And we had to walk home every day. At a very young age, I I knew that, like, I felt like I, I'm not saying that anybody should do this by any means. I think that you should definitely try to figure out a solution, you know, talk to the principal, talk to the parents, whatever you need to do. I definitely believe in that. But, you know, this was a time when our mom was 100 miles away, and I'm supposed to be pretty much his dad, you know, his dad dipped out before he was even born. So it was my job to take care of him. And we had to walk home from school. So I couldn't have anybody messing with him, haven't messed with us. So I made an example of that kid and didn't have any problems after that. So sometimes you got to do that, man. (laughs) I mean, that's to protect your family. And I mean, that's what they talk about. And if you go to jail, right, you got to pick the biggest, baddest dude and take him out so that you establish some sort of you know, presence or something. Sometimes That's, you got you got to do that, man. You got to take take the biggest bully out so that nobody wants to mess with you. That's what they say. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I don't want to go through that. I'll never be in jail for, but that's what I hear. <laughs> and it's crazy too, because you know, not to blame this on my grandmother, but she was pretty hardcore and. You know, I paid close attention when we were doing some of the Taekwondo stuff and doing boxing and stuff like that. Just remembered some of those things and techniques kind of kicking in. 
and uh, just sort of went right for it. So it was probably really good for you to be doing Taekwondo and boxing and help with some of that aggression. Oh yeah. (laughs) Most, (laughs) most definitely. So now I remember we had this jar in the house and there was a picture of uh, Iowa or whatever on it. And my mom was, you know, really into these country towns and different things like that. And she always wanted to be somewhere different. And I'll talk about this because I I learned a lot from her blaming everybody for her problems and I remember always her saying like why me you know you drop something why me this doesn't happen to anybody else why do I have to live in this town why 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 and it's something that always stuck with me to not blame anybody from your for your problems it's you are in a situation you make the best of it if you want to be somewhere else, you create positive goals and make the right choices every day in order to to get there. Nothing comes easy and nothing comes fast. But I remember seeing that at a very young age and that meant a lot to me as I got older. Yeah. So she had put together some money and decided to go to Iowa. And for whatever reason, I was not going on that trip. So I ended up moving back to Vegas again in the middle of fifth grade year. Hmm. So do that. They moved to Iowa, and um, I don't think it's quite the place that she wanted it to be. Um, I'll speed things up a little bit. This is probably the longest I've lived in a place. I, I stay in Vegas from fifth grade, middle of fifth grade year to about my sophomore yeah sophomore yeah, year sophomore. yeah out there but so things don't work out in Iowa moves back to Atalanto and I remember she does this again probably some years later but decides to pack everything sell everything and move to Vermont doesn't know anybody in Vermont and the craziest thing they drive clear across the country and go into a subway and I guess she got really bad service um, from this chick that was working at Subway. <laughs> and she turns around and comes all the way back That's home. That's right. That's right. Because of that. That's crazy. It's oh, one of man. the craziest. I think about that sometimes and I'm just like, wow. I'm glad. I can't imagine. What if you went somewhere else? Right. Like, <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. That's. That's a crazy story. That's a long drive to just turn right around, right back around too. Yeah. So living in Vegas, this was another roller coaster chapter in my life that I can't get into everything because we don't have a million hours to talk about all this. But something that was pretty crazy to me, I think this was around, you know, when I had just moved out there. My parents were going to Tucson for some kind of family get together or something like that. And the idea was I was going to stay with my, my cousin and, you know, he was, we were pretty close. He was 18 years old. He was super into sports. He was a great football player, basketball player, just really one hell of an athlete. And he was a hell of a worker. He worked on, you know, my aunt and uncle's ranch in this little town, Kelso, California, which is about 50 miles south of Baker, California. Yeah, he was supposed to watch me, pick me up in Vegas, and we were going to hang out until they got back. For whatever reason, last minute, they decide that they want me to go to Tucson. So I end up not going with him. And we go to Tucson. And a couple days later, get a phone call at my grandma's house. And I pick it up. And my cousin is crying hysterically. And she's asking for her parents, and I just knew something was obviously terribly wrong. And I hand the phone over to my aunt, and I remember uh, she just lost it. Um, So they just gotten the news that my cousin had passed away. He got in a car accident driving from from Baker to Kelso. You know, it's a two lane road all the way out there, Hmm. and he had gotten in a, a car accident. Remember, he had this Toyota pickup. We were in all the time. He, uh, strong motherfucker. 
he must have had a blowout and he rolled off into the desert and he crawled so far because he was out there for a really long time. And I guess a postman um, kind of saw him like on the side of the road mm. and from where he was to where the, the truck was, there was kind of like this sort of slithering path, wow. if you would. So that happened and things kind of got turned upside down. That was, uh, you know, my first experience with losing somebody that I was close with and everybody around me was very close with. This was somebody that was going to do big things and was expected to do big things. Yeah. It was just, it was a bad time. That's tough. Yeah. But you know, we all, we all got through it. So Another thing that happens is I struggle in and out of my life with being a little bit overweight. You know, I've laughed about, you know, <laughs> where I ask Sam, my stepmom, I say, you know, am I, am I fat? Cause you know, there's some kids that are <laughs> talking some shit and she's like, no, no, no way. You're, you're not as tall as you're going to be. Um, you're a little husky, but and I think to anybody else, they'd have been like husky, but like, what right, the f- right. <laughs> Shit. Just tell me, I'm, don't say I'm husky. But I remember I didn't take it that way, which is kind of crazy. Um, I was just like, nah, okay. Huskies are cool. I remember I used to like, I got like a husky like sweatshirt and I was just like, yeah. Like husky dude. And I always gave you crap over your, that California angels picture that it was hanging <laughs> in your mom's house. <laughs> You wearing your baseball jersey with your glasses on? Oh, dude. <laughs> Little husky. <laughs> oh, dude, so bad. I like, remember, why did your mom keep this up? Dude, oh. I told you there was the donut shop by oh, my yeah, middle yeah. school. <laughs> and I used to go in there and get like, you know, same thing. I would get like a, you know, a maple bar too and a, and a Yoo-Hoo. And, uh, a bear claw, you mean? <laughs> okay. Maybe it's a couple apple fritters. <laughs> Everybody, anybody that's close to me knows I like a good apple fritter. Yeah, <laughs> which is like the most ginormous no. donut ever. <laughs> do we like it so much, dude? When we were in Texas visiting Ledge Lounger, oh, do yeah. we not like just yeah. random stop at a yeah, donut shop? So funny. I'm all, what is? Ooh, what is that? That that donut shot looks legit. <laughs> Let's just go peek in there and see what's up. I don't even think you guys got anything. I anything. I got like a big ass <laughs> apple fritter. I'm just this apple oh. fritter connoisseur. <laughs> like, oh yeah, it's got the weight, it's got the texture. Right. Oh yeah, this is this, this is, is a good. good one. This is a good one for sure. But so, back to you, who? Yeah. So I didn't have any problems um, with these uh, uh, the donuts and the you who request. And one day, I remember the lady behind the counter. I walk in and she says, "You know, fat boy, want a you who?" <laughs> And I remember oh, I just, like, she said, fat boy, one of you who, and I just remember, like, no, like, screw this. Like, this is a freaking problem. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I struggled a little bit with that for a while. I was in middle school, and I do remember I was always... For however big I was, I was always the fastest. My nickname was Wheels because no matter how small anybody was or how fast they were, like I was just, I was always the fastest. Yeah, man. So, you were crazy fast. <laughs> you had the big old calves. <laughs> <laughs> so I got that nickname and I, I remember eighth grade year doing like kind of football stuff and I, I wanted to play because I, I enjoyed football during PE and stuff like that. And they told me to go out for it because they're like, dude, you've got – you're the fastest kid out here and you've got the best hands that, like, we've seen. Like, I've never not seen you catch a ball. I mean, I broke my collarbone on that football field in middle school, oh, like, yeah. catching something. I freaking running full speed ran into a pole and freaking, <laughs> you know, broke my shoulder. So I remember going out for football. Um, this was a new school being built, that new high school being built. And they're kind of looking at all the different kids in the middle school. And I'm like, yeah, I want to be a wide receiver. And they're like, no, like you're not. You're way too big to be a wide receiver. And I wasn't like like super big, but it was definitely – I was too big to be a wide receiver. And they're like, no, we get it. Like you were super quick, but you're going to be 
like a tackle or a tight end. And I don't know football like that. So I'm like, I don't know what that shit is, but (laughs) I'm not doing it. (laughs) Like I'm the dude that's going to like run as fast as I can towards the goalpost. And I'm going to, I'm going to catch the ball. I'm going to score a touchdown. That's that's what I'm going to (laughs) do. And so I did that for a little bit. And then I'm just like, you know, this this is not working out because it started getting really difficult, like finding rides back home. Uh, my stepmom, you know, she was a, a small business owner. She did engraved plates and different things like that. And my dad worked for the railroad. So it was really difficult to really get rides or do anything. So I found a skateboard. I remember mm-hmm. uh, a friend visit from California and he had this, uh, this trans world magazines. It was Andrew Reynolds just doing like a fat backside 180 over the staircase. And I was just like, like, damn, like that's, that's pretty freaking cool. And I'd been disconnected from skateboarding. Like I messed around when I was really little, but I've been disconnected for a while. And I remember just thinking that that was the, the coolest thing and that nobody could take that away from me. I could get a skateboard, you know, as an investment, but that was something that I could always put on the ground and just, you know, pedal to wherever I wanted to go and, and do whatever I wanted to do. So that really got all of my attention. And I thank God every day for a skateboard because it got, it got me through a lot. And it taught me a lot of life lessons about patience and, and being consistent and, you know, all sorts of different things. It, it got me into a little bit of trouble too, sure. you know. I don't know how it can't, but, you know, <laughs> we would skate down the strip and, you know, we get chased off of properties like Caesar's Palace and Excalibur. We'd be getting chased off because you're not supposed to be skating around there. But when you get a skateboard and you kind of start, you know, hanging around kids that skate, it's kind of this uh, sort of a brotherhood, you know, we're all just, yeah. I feel like a lot of the kids I skated with were pretty cool, unfortunately all kind of from broken homes and a little bit probably confused where what life was and you know what we were supposed to be doing but man when we were skateboarding like it didn't matter what we were going home to nothing else in the world mattered it was just we had great laughs and we were and we were just having fun treading so that's what I did and you know starting to lose a little bit of weight but you know I really got to a point where I took it to another um, level And this is something that really not proud of this. I don't, when I was young, I didn't realize the effect that this would have on me, but I, I started taking ephedra pills, which somebody recommended it, you know, because at this time this was like, you know, they're just, you know, lose weight pills. They speed up your metabolism. You get a lot of energy. It's an appetite suppressant, all these different things. So I start taking these things and my appetite goes away completely. I mean, I was going days without eating. And when I, when I was, I would, I would have a sandwich. It was just meat and bread and I would cut it in half and I would eat one half of one portion of the day and I'd eat the other portion of another. And I remember going into my freshman year of high school, I probably lost like, like 60 pounds or something like that. Mm. I mean, I was like crazy freaking skinny and you know, there's a side effect of these pills where I had crazy mood swings where I'd be coming down off of this. And I would just, man, I would just, uh, I was, I was raging, you know, every little thing would set me off. You know, when you were on it, you were really high tempo. You had a ton of energy and you were loving life. Things were good, but there's a reason why you can't get these anymore. Yeah. It's cause they, they really mess with you and mess with your head. So did that losing weight, and get to kind of a pivotal moment in my life, um, sophomore year of high school, where I'm going to go snowboarding, which is something that I did, you know, a little bit. I was going to go snowboarding with a friend that had a cabin up in Brianhead. We were going to go get our boards hot waxed as, you know, mom was taking us, whatever. I remember got to my house, picked me up, whatever. And we were like, you know what, should just stay the night. You know what I mean? We got to wake up super early anyway and just stay the night. And remember just going and talking to my, my dad's stepmom. They had some friends over and I said, Hey, you know, it's already 
five o'clock, whatever, like after we get done, can I just stay the night over there? Um, so, cause we're going in the morning or whatever. Remember he said, no, I remember I forever, this was the worst way to handle it, but my whole life, you know, has been just full of confusion and people saying no, and I can't do things. And I was really frustrated because it didn't make any sense that I couldn't do this. So I kind of flipped out. I was not, I think, myself, and I flipped out, and I I went off on him uh, probably for like a whole two minutes. I mean, I, I really went crazy. I embarrassed him pretty much, and that's something that you all know. You don't outshine your master, <laughs> and uh, that's rule number one. Right. And I totally screwed that up, and I went about that wrongly. So very calmly said that at the end of the year, like which was – I'm not sure how long, much. So it was the winter time. So it might've been, you know, a few more months, but it's like when, uh, the school year gets over, like you're done here, nothing is going to change my mind. Like you're moving back to your mom's. And this was a very long period of time where I was very disconnected. You know, my mom and my brother, like I, we had talked a little bit, but I really did not probably fully know their situation. This just seemed very crazy. And this was very difficult because I was really starting to, I was a skater. I was a teenager. I was starting to find you yourself know, in a way. Yeah. Yeah. I was really doing all of those different things. So that all happens. And I was really, really difficult, but I ended up leaving Las Vegas and going to Victorville. I remember, you know, being there like a week my brother is out in the desert and uh, <laughs> yeah. he's out in the desert and he comes back, you know, he used to just kind of like wander a little bit and he comes back into the apartment. We lived in these like sort of, you know, they were low income apartments. And I remember he, uh, he came up and he said, man, I saw something flapping out there. It looked like a dead body. I had nothing else to do. It seems, I guess, kind of interesting. I didn't think that that's right. what he really could have found. Right. But, you know, this is a good probably reality check of where, I, where I'm back at. So wander out there, and sure enough, like, there's a, a dead body out there right next to where we live. So remember, uh ended up having to call the cops, and they're kind of questioning us and going through our shit. I was, uh like, first weekend, and I remember – Oh, I'm just skating around everywhere. I'm meeting a few people and I ended up running away for probably about a couple of weeks. There's just so much new stuff going on. And my, I don't even know, like didn't have a cell phone. There was no way to reach out to people that I had had my best friends back home and so many things going on. I ended up having somebody pick me up and I, ended up going back there and I was at a friend's uh, apartment and I was just kind of skating and hanging out. I was like pretty much sleeping by the pool and kind of a weird time where it's like, like you don't really know what the hell's going on. Like what the, what the hell can happen now? You know right. what I mean? Like right. shit's getting flipped upside down and I end up, you know, going back and, you know, I'm getting in trouble for obviously that situation. I remember I was skating at night at a school. I was actually the high school that I was going to go to. Right. Um, and we're skating there. There's like this stair set and we're all kind of sessioning for a, a little while. And uh, security guard runs up on us and everybody takes off and take off as well. And I remember he grabbed my backpack. I left it. I just ran over there and put my hands on it. And we're just kind of tugging on it both ways. And I remember letting go of my backpack, not really thinking, because I guess I think that he would fall back and like let go or whatever. But of course he kind of uh, stumbled back and went down these stairs and ended up getting like a couple stitches or something. I guess that's what I was told. He ended up keeping my backpack, threw it in his office, locked it up. And uh, you know, my wallet and all that stuff was in there. And my mom had to go back to this school and, you know, get it back, <laughs> oh, which man. I heard it was a very awkward conversation. I'm sure. And she's like, well, I didn't want you to go there in the first place. You're not going there. 
I've already got you signed up. You're going to this Christian school. Just when I thought like things couldn't get worse, like they really, they were slowly, slowly getting worse. Oh man! So, end up going to this Christian school and said, "You're also going to play football." And at this time, I've kind of outcasted sports. I mean, I'm fully, you know, I'm wearing you know tight white jeans and uh, yep. Ramon t-shirts. Yep. And, uh, I've got longer <laughs> hair at the time. Like I'm not really in the the mindset for for football, but. She says, I got to play. So she says, we're going to go meet the coach, meet the team, and this and that. So that's where I go to Christian school for the first time, and I I see this whole team, and I feel like everybody's looking at me like I'm an alien from a whole other planet. <laughs> <laughs> well, they were. We were. Uh, that's Well, in football, you start before – you know, school actually starts. So that was like the summer of, before yeah. our junior year. So it was like us out there during hell week or whatever. And then this kid comes up with his mom looking like a skater kid. <laughs> I remember introducing you to Obia. I'm pretty sure it was me and one other person that like, there wasn't a whole team that came and met you. It was like me, Obi and somebody else or something. Oh really? I don't remember, but I do remember talking or saying hi to you or something that, that first day. <laughs> yeah. But it was always kind of in me to be that person. So I probably, I just probably said hi to to make it like less awkward and try to make you feel less awkward. (laughs) But it it was pretty weird. (laughs) Probably like, oh yeah, here's the uh, typical white Christian school kid that's going to have the big freaking smile and just act like everything is totally dandy. That's probably what you thought about me. It's freaking not. Okay, let's just cut through the shit. I don't want to be here. Yeah. Like, I think that was pretty <laughs> evident. <laughs> your face, um, your facial expressions weren't the, weren't the greatest. <laughs> but you know, it's, uh, oh, man, so many times you're, you're getting your world, you know, sort of flipped upside down and you're, you're frustrated with the mistakes that you've made and other people have made and wishing that, because back to the whole thing with, you know, kind of getting kicked out of Vegas was like I always hear people getting in trouble and they get to just talk about with their parents, but I never got that. It was just always like an immediate, like, now you're freaking done. Like right. there's no talking about it. Like you're just, you messed up, you're done. So there was a, a lot of emotions and sort of baggage being, you know, dragged into this. But this is um, this is the part of the story where... I am now a junior at the Christian school <laughs> and this is where we pretty much connect. I mean, yeah. I think I'm, we're playing, you know, football or whatever, but it wasn't, we really didn't connect until we started working at the mattress store mm-hmm. together, um, which I, we we're trying to figure this out, but I think that I overheard you or somebody saying that needed some help at, you know, the mattress store and I remember I just like lit up because, you know, my mom is, you know, really poor. I don't have any money. I don't have a vehicle. I don't have anything. And it's already difficult enough where I'm trying to blend in with the school. Most of the kids like have money, parents with money and different things like that. So yeah. it seemed like a great opportunity to, to, you know, make some money. Yeah. Yeah. I had a I had a bad A Bronco that my dad bought. I forgot to mention that piece. Still bad A. It is. <laughs> and it was uh yeah, I mean I I paid for the lift kit, but we lifted it, put you know, banging tires and rims on it. It had a tricked out sound system, security system. My dad put like a roll bar in it with a with a soft top on the top and like, you know, he took the tar- hard top off all the time, drove around. But then he bought him his he bought me a trailer you want to, this is another piece of being like the, the first young, uh, the first born, like I had to get a job when I was 15 and a half pretty much. So, and I had my permit and then I guess as soon as I could get my license and drive, like I had this job. So he bought this trailer for us to deliver mattresses in. And so that's what I, I did on Saturdays mostly. And then like Wednesday, I think it was Wednesday nights because the delivery truck would come in Wednesday morning and then we, or Tuesday and then they would be all set up for us Wednesday night or whatever. 
So, or Wednesday after school. So we used to do that. And then I had another, we had another friend that worked with me. I think, yeah, I think he couldn't work someday or one Saturday or something. And he worked with me and that's kind of how, I mean, I, I thought about this more because our junior year, I was actually a wide receiver and so are you. So I think that probably mm. now we think about it, I think because we spent more time with the wide receivers together, senior year, I played quarterback, but cause our quarterback got hurt. And so, but I do think we probably spent more time like yeah. with receivers or something. That's how it probably became a little closer f- at first. But yeah, yeah, the mattress store, man, like <laughs> I love the mattress store, dude. Like it was so fun. There was, you know, so many freaking funny stories. Like we used to, we used to like, I don't know why uh, he must've paid us to stay late at night after school because he went him and him and the other guy weren't ever there. And we used to stack the mattresses, like all the twin mattresses. So we would stack like eight or nine of them up in the air and play like Olympics or something <laughs> <laughs> where we would run, jump and see how many, like two, how many twin mattresses we could jump over and like land on the other side. And then we would take, I remember we took like water one time and like put it all over the water, the like uh, plastic of mattresses. And we like took these cardboard boxes, which came on, came on the king size beds and like ran and slid on the boxes, trying to slide on the, on the mattresses. Oh my gosh. <laughs> oh, and then, I mean, the, you hiding under the freaking tarp. That was so funny. Out there, it was, it was across the street was like this gas station. You probably tell it better, but there. Oh yeah, <laughs> you had this tarp. <laughs> yeah, there. So it was like the tarp that the uh, the mattresses are in, and this was like a colored one. <laughs> oh yeah. So I ended up getting inside this bag and just like kind of walking to the gas station. So it looked like this bag is just like walking around by itself. And I remember somebody just coming up to the bag, and they were like, you know, VVPD. <laughs> And I remember I was like, oh, shit, man. Like, you kidding me? The freaking, like, right? Like, who the hell's looking out after me? You tell me there's a cop right here? Right. But I ended up getting out of the bag, and it was like nobody. It was probably like a freaking homeless person. Right. Like, oh, man, I was just saying, what the hell? Like, I knew, I knew this bag couldn't just be walking around by itself. But I remember we eat at, eat at Little Lola's. Caesars. Little Caesars, man. Little, oh yeah, Little Caesars right next to it. But I was getting at like yeah, <laughs> Little Caesars because it was next to the trash right, can. Right. Yep. And, yep. Yep. Dude, remember the 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 bum that was in the trash oh, can? Oh yes, yes, yes. I remember him, Mister Brother that, John. I'm sure he open won't that, listen to this, but <laughs> open the trash can up and just like somebody yelling from a trash can, who turned the lights on? <laughs> um, <laughs> that is, um, that's pretty hard. Good old Brother but, John. <laughs> Says a lot about where we came Dude, from. That guy was crazy, man. He he was like, a, if you ever met any, nobody has ever met a vegetarian bum, which was what he was, and it was pretty insane. Because I mean, you tried to, you can tell the sandwich story, but I I tried to buy him, or the I think it was AM PM it was the, what it was. So we, but I used to try, I tried to buy him like a hot dog one time because I saw him in the trash can and he's eating a bag of, <laughs> <laughs> he's eating a bag of like old popcorn, and I'm like, hey brother John, you want? You want a you want a hot dog or something? And man, he went off of me like for like five minutes. How dare you think I would eat some kind of meat that is processed by blah 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 blah? And I was like, oh man, I just just offering you a hot dog. Like he, he don't want it. What like, kind of freaking <laughs> bum are you? You want you want some food or not? <laughs> yeah, man, you try to buy him a subway. Oh, never again. <laughs> so I have a similar story, but I don't know. This might have been later in life because he went off on me first for calling him Brother John. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because he's like, that name is associated with... So for anybody that doesn't know, he is totally (laughs) associated for being like a skate shop's like mascot for their videos. Um, And it just caused a whole bunch of problems. And they gave him that name. That's right. And that... Whatever stint happened, he he does not like being called that. So I yell at him and he... Flips out. Do not call me that. You're like, whatever. Awesome. And I'm like, whatever, dude. Like, do you want some freaking subway? I'm about to go in here. And he's like, like, he's just like kind of arrogant. Like, yes. So go in there and right away, I'm ordering a sandwich and he asked for a peanut butter and jelly. And they say, we don't have that. <laughs> and he freaking flips out. Like, this is the most popular sandwich you know, store in the world. And that is the most common, you know, sandwich of all time. How the hell do you not have peanut butter and jelly? And they're just like, don't know, man. Uh, You want like a, you know, 
uh, some with meat on it. <laughs> yeah, you want to you want a cold cut, <laughs> right? And he just, then he loses it again because he's like, like oh, like you know, if you, you want me to you want me to kill this animal, <laughs> right, right? just goes on this crazy rant. And I'm just about to be like, dude, like pay for your own damn sandwich. Like this right. is just way too much freaking work. But. Do you remember one time he he brought the baby bird? Like he had that little baby bird that died, and he brought it in, and with <laughs> and, and our right. and our boss was was there, and he brought it into the store, and he was like telling this story about this baby bird, how he was so precious, and this and that, and it was just like, man, I remember our boss was like, yeah, don't let that guy at the door anymore. <laughs> like, because he used to let him sleep in there. I know. Went in there one day and opened up the, <laughs> the room where we would put mattresses mm-hmm. and we would actually put the futons together. Mm-hmm. Opened the door and I just hit him in the back of the head. And he's just like getting frustrated. Like, what are you doing in here? <laughs> and why the hell would you take a nap on the floor next right. to the it's door? door. <laughs> like, what the hell's wrong with you? So anyway, that's uh, that's you, Brother John. Yeah. And, if you ever hear this, like... Hmm. We appreciate you. We had, we had actually quite a few bums. We had the remember the people we bought In and Out for, and like I don't I don't know if you were there with me, but we I think you were. We bought In and Out for them, and they were telling us all stories. I won't say the details of it, but like you never had a good woman until you oh had a homeless God. woman, and I it's like oh my gosh, almost threw in my mouth. And then we had the cool dude that was like that stood on the corner across from McDonald's, and he used to give away American flags or sell American flags so he could stay in in the hotel. Like, I don't know if you remember him. He was a really cool dude. He was like an ex, ex-military. ex But yeah, we, we had all kinds of interactions with the with the bums there. Yeah, they were, they were, they were a cool. lot more interesting than the bums <laughs> yeah, here in Scottsdale. Yeah, they were. <laughs> <laughs> That's for sure. Um, I think it was just part of, I mean, we just care for people, man. Just a piece of it. Tried, oh, yeah. tried to help them out, but. Always, man. So we had a good time and that's where we really connected was at, you know, Diamond Mattress. I mean, we were doing our job, but man, that was the, that was some of the most fun that I ever had because like we were talking about the other night, I think that really for the first time ever got to be, um, ourselves. There was no, there was no pressure of, you know, having to be, you know, something else or anything like that, which really caught me off guard because I had, I'd seen you from afar and knew who you were and, school and different things like that. And you were still, you know, kind of goody two shoes, but you know, you were like, you're just having fun. And, you know, I was, I've always been a respectful person and I'm naturally, um, empathetic and, you know, I think I, I really am. It's when I feel like somebody else comes into the mix that I need to be something different. And I really always enjoyed our time together where we were working at the mattress store, or going to Circuit City and getting <laughs> CDs or mm-hmm. whatever it is that we are doing. We always just, uh, we couldn't be more different, but it's the best, you know, opposite to track story for sure. Yeah, man. And you can't forget Lola's dude. Remember? Dude, man, we, we really <laughs> did go out of our way. It's like, um, not on the route. Uh, we're going 20 miles out of the way anyway. And there's this Mexican food place, man. I, I, I still never had as good a carne asada as there. And we used to have, like, I have no idea how, because I could, I'm way fatter right now than I was then. And I could never eat two of these burritos. But somehow, like, we used to eat two carne asada burritos while working on route, like, after football practice. <laughs> Two Dude, big A's. These were so <laughs> freaking big. We would eat these like no problem oh and and like still go put together futons, yeah. deliver mattresses <laughs> upstairs. Like we would do all these different things and it would still um <laughs> like it was Dude, crazy. There's so much story like that. And I remember that we used to have like air fresheners that we would keep inside because people's houses stunk so much you rub oh, it on, rub it on your nose dude. and like there were so many funny stories man I remember the, the tip buttons my dad got us because our boss didn't want us to ask for tips so like he wanted us to wear these buttons that said tips appreciated and again you know I didn't want to disappoint my dad so we would like we just wore them <laughs> but I think you know we're kind of like you know early on entrepreneurs yeah for sure I mean we were uh thinking of different ways to like make the store more money. Mm-hmm. Remember 
we didn't understand why it didn't throw the delivery fee into the cost of the mattress. Right. It was like, dude, like just tell them that it comes with free delivery. Just throw it in the cost. Yeah. But, Pretty obvious. You know, we were just, you know, high school kids. What, what do we know? <laughs> so that definitely did not happen. It's really difficult because we had a lot of good memories mm-hmm. um, working there, but it was, it was another life and it was a long yeah. time ago. And For sure. It was a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's, yeah, man, I, I, I think I kind of just thought of this, you know, we, we spend a lot of time now together late nights on Wednesday nights and that's kind of some of our best talks. I, I think that was even back then, you know, some of those times of delivering mattresses together were probably some of the best times we ever had in real talk and just me and you with nobody else around was kind of the same situation as as we do now i mean just late nights together working yeah and i think it all goes back you start brothers and talk about me coming out here to to do it with you Mm -hmm. like that was where it all started like i knew what it was like to work with you and right there's not you know very many people that like i trust or feel comfortable enough to like work with and i knew that we there were so many years when we get to that part of the story that because you were in Arizona and I was still back in Victorville, I knew that what it was like working with you. And I was like, dude, we get reunited. It'll be work, but it's, it's going to be a good time and shit's going to get done. The trust is a big thing. Mm -hmm. Like I always trusted, trusted you. And that's always like probably one of the, the big hurdles and the big, the reason why companies fail when they have partners is because one of them gets greedy sure. and, or somebody doesn't pull their weight or, you know, something happens like that. Right. And I think we knew that we could definitely, you know, trust each other in any one of those departments. Yeah, man, for sure. So we're, we're doing the thing. We're delivering the mattresses, going to school, playing football, all these different things. And, uh, this is where kind of get probably one of the the biggest lessons of, of my life. And Mm -hmm. I know you got a lot from it too, Ty. This is something don't talk about, you know, too, too much, but it is what's shaped me. And it is, uh, so this is the moment that really sort of, you know, shaped me for the better and for the worst. Mm -hmm. Um, so I remember, stayed the night, you know, with you, you know, we were getting a lot closer. We were hanging out more. I was hanging out with your family and different things like that. And I remember, um, you give me a ride back to my apartment and we get to my apartment and, you know, all of my, all of my stuff is going down the stairs all over the lawn. And, you know, you just see it. And I, I knew that this wasn't good. I go up there and I'm knocking on the door and it's locked and I'm pretty much yelling at the door. And, you know, my mom is saying, I don't know you pretty much like a shame to me, all this stuff. Like this is not your home anymore. And it's a, it's a, it's a, that was a really difficult thing to do. And I had to, I had to do that next to you where me and you were very close, but I was extremely embarrassed I didn't really know what was going on. And I remember just kind of freaking out and the cops got called and they were there. And I remember the cop kind of looking like he was going to be a jerk. And then I'm just kind of in tears and I'm explaining this to him. And I remember he was just like, I'm really sorry, man. If you need a hand, you know, getting this stuff together, like, let me know. Yeah. And I remember this is where it gets real as I I remember uh, calling my dad, you know, because I don't have anywhere to go at this point. You know, I'd been kicked out of my dad's been kicked out of now my mom's and she's on a whole nother level where she doesn't, she's ashamed of me. She doesn't even know who I am. And I call him and he pretty much says, you need to figure it out. You can't come here. You got to figure it out. And that's really all that there was to it. Man, I had a roller coaster of a life up to that point. But that was when I, I truly felt like I was 
I was all alone. I might as I might as well have been in outer space floating around because I can't think of a moment in my life where I felt like more alone. You know, it was like the two people that had made me and now they didn't even know me. You know, I'm like 16 years old and that's, uh, it was the, the worst and best time because you were there and probably in shock and you really like comforted me and me and you always have that tie. And I, I think about it. I think about it often when I wake up and I, and I have, I have this beautiful life Mm -hmm. and, you know, I, I think about the, the really hard times and I think about how you could have, you could have said you were sorry and you could have just went back to, you know, your leave it to beaver life is I always mess (laughs) with you guys, but you, you had a solution. You said, I don't know, but what do you think about living with our family Mm -hmm. and, you know, we can get your things together and we can go to my house and talk to my parents about it. And we did. And we talked about it with your mom and dad. We came to a resolution and I was pretty much accepted in your guys' house. Like, yeah, man, that day is, um, you know, we, we've been talking about doing this episode for a couple of weeks now. And this, <laughs> this has been the moment I think we've thought about a lot. And that moment to me changed, it changed my whole life too, because I've never seen, I've never seen anything like that as a sheltered kid, kind of in a bubble. It's never uh, something I've been a part of or seen. And to see like your whole life packed up on one porch and what happened after and the screaming and yelling and the stuff she said and stuff you said, man, like you couldn't imagine your mom doing that. Just like no. I couldn't imagine, or, you know, my wife, Karina, I couldn't, we could not imagine or fathom even thinking about disowning our kids or throwing our, our kids out. And mm-hmm. it makes it so much harder because, you know, I've probably painted this picture of <clears throat> my mom is this, you know, strict person and, she's religious and all this stuff. And she was all those things, but you know, we hold on to a lot of the good too. And I do remember a lot of good times where she always thought that I was so funny and you know, I was her first, you know? <clears throat> yeah. So it's, yeah, uh, you still, it's, you, it's still lo- you still love your mom, man, no matter what. That's it's something a child should never have to go through. But uh, it changed my life seeing that, but it but it also changes our life for forever, and I didn't really know how to react to that, to be honest. And I've keep thinking I've kept thinking about that moment the last couple of weeks, and I, I I just remember I I mean I don't think it, up to that point you had shown much emotion, and we probably weren't very emotional with each other, and I knew you weren't really that kind of person, so. You know, to see you, I remember sitting in the truck and you just, after you hung up with your dad and, and, and bawling and crying, I'd never seen that part of you and you'd never been that vulnerable with me to that point. And, you know, I just, I didn't really know what to do. I just put my hand on your shoulder and I, I tried to comfort you like I, like the best I could. But it's, that to me is the whole reason. I mean, <laughs> that's, that's what makes us strong. Oh, that's what bonds our friendship and our and our and our brotherhood. And I mean, when you see somebody go through like the lowest moment of their whole life, and you live it, you know, we're talking about it. But in, if you're not in that moment and you don't experience it, you don't see it, you don't understand the impact as much as we do. So you know, it was a very pivotal moment, and i'm glad my parents said yes i I mean it was just an idea i threw out there and i think we originally talked about you staying for a week and then it turned in for long to longer but you know you you became i think you became my brother at that time and moment without really i mean we only know each other for a few months but at that we had a bond right there that nobody very few people have i think 
taught me to to really put up this uh this guard like I didn't after that I really did not trust anybody I did not have very good relationships you know I was definitely sort of like damaged goods at this point in terms of trusting anybody but in the midst of all of that I felt like I truly trusted you because what the hell do you have to gain from this you were my friend when you really didn't need to be and you were there by my side going through this shit when you really didn't need to be like everything is like good in your world and you stepping in I think now more as an adult that I'm so lucky because that situation plays out for probably a lot of people in this world, except they don't have, you know, they don't have Tyler. They don't have, they don't have somebody there that's willing to put their neck on the line to have you move into their home or at least someone there to figure it out. They just have to go through it. That's really turning a negative into a positive where I'm so grateful that it happened because it's uh, made me who I am, but I'm also extremely grateful more than anybody will ever know that I got to be with your family because there was so much that came from that. I saw how a family was supposed to run. You know what I mean? I saw what real love looked like. I saw what it was like for people to eat, eat at a dinner table and have real conversations and laugh and love and talk about all these different things and the talks I had with your mother and the talks that I had with your dad and the discipline that I got, you know, as well. Cause I remember I wasn't perfect, you know, I moved in and I still had some issues, yeah. but I remember your dad very early on, like something happened and I remember him getting in my face <clears throat> and I'll never forget it. Cause he got in my face and was telling me, you know, some stuff and we, and we connected because he understood me. And I remember him being like, you know, I understand like a lot of people don't understand you, but I do. Mm -hmm. And he's like, I know people turn their back on you. He's like, but it's not going to happen here. And that never forget that. Cause that's my experience. That's what happens is it just, yeah. You know, it just sometimes I felt like I was just uh, like that cowboy passing through town, you know. Right. And it's like I'm just passing through. Like, I don't know what the hell I'm doing here. Like, I'm just I'm just here for a little bit. It's like nobody's ever taken my life serious. Yeah. But at those moments and those conversations, they they were everything to me because I, I was learning that the only way I can get out of this hole is by is by being better and making good choices and not blaming people for problems. And even as frustrated as your parents might have been with maybe my parents, they always they always taught me to forgive, you know, you're gonna always hold on to that. And I always I did. I did forgive and I always did my best in that department. And, you know, being taught that the rage that I had inside me to to do my best to to ball that up and to put it into something positive because your dad had it too. And it's like, it's it's okay to be passionate and to have that that fire inside you. But you've there's an art to it. You've you have it. You just have to learn to to harness it and put it and to put it somewhere else. So it's taken a lot of time and it's it's always a work in progress, but you know, that's really what it was is, you know, trying to be calm and try to put all that negative energy into something positive. Yeah. Well, since then, I mean, it's, it's developed over a long period of time, but you've been, <laughs> I mean, you've been part of our family since then and pretty awesome. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> Dude, it's been, <laughs> it's been the best. I, man, I had, I don't know how long I had been in the house for, but pretty much planned, you know, the Hawaii trip. Yeah. And your her, your parents telling me that we're going to Hawaii. Like, I don't even, my like first thought 
like is like like yeah like i'll hold down the fort whatever it's like like no you're coming like i'm going to hawaii right like holy shit (laughs) i mean just in you know all honesty like my parents went on vacation when i was younger but i didn't get to go on those vacations like they went on vacation i stayed home right you know for me to be able to do that was just the it was one of the coolest experiences that I had ever had. And just being with the family and being in Hawaii, I remember getting to feel things I had never felt in my life. And I knew that those were not things that normal people did. And I think that the people I had been around, I understood that somebody had to work really freaking hard and make really good choices to be able to make that shit happen. And right then and there, I felt like I... I wanted to do something with my life and be somebody because I wanted to have a family one day. I wanted to be the man of the house and have a wife like your mom and, you know, have kids and, you know, teach them and and make a good living so that, you know, we can do different things. Those were all things that I was making mental note of while they're happening. The Hawaii trip. So much fun. So much fun. Yeah. It's pretty, it goes back to me talking about my dad being the whole whole thing about my parents. The fact that my parents even let you come stay with us in itself is pretty, pretty crazy. I mean, we had a pretty, like you said, leave it to beaver life of a pretty one that didn't have a lot of ripples in it. And that threw a big ripple in it. And back to that moment, we had to grow up. I think you and I grew up a lot in that moment and you know, it changed a lot of things, but that the, yeah, man, the fact that they did, my parents are, are pretty incredible to even open those doors. And I mean, I had an idea of like, you know, I, I know though, I know my parents heart and I know that they will want to, to help you. I just don't know what that looks like. Cause I don't have the money. <laughs> I mean, it's not my money. So, you know, or my house, but yeah, the Hawaii trip, man. And then and again, like for, to bringing some, kid i mean at that point i guess we were going into senior year so you live with us for about eight months or nine months so hawaii is not cheap and we went to the pro bowl which was awesome and then like so i mean there was a lot of expenses to that and snorkeling snorkeling yeah everything was very expensive yeah parasailing Oh, oh, good old Toby screaming the whole time. Oh, <laughs> I wasn't going to bring it up. My little brother was, uh, if we were 18, 17, he had to be 11. So he got, you got oh, tied poor up. Poor Toby, him. man. I, I put, so that's the youngest of the yeah. Rasmussen brothers. And I've put that kid through some shit. <laughs> Besides a parasailing event where he is freaking out up there, nobody can hear him. And we're just <laughs> laughing. But, dude, I remember this one time um, we had firecrackers. Oh, yeah. We got firecrackers probably in Laughlin or something like that. Yeah, that was yeah. another trip, another trip we, we took, on. yeah. And um, got firecrackers, and we were all by the spa or the pool. And I was – I lit one, and I was just going to, like, scare your brother. What a dumbass I am. <laughs> oh. I, I throw it this – firecracker like bounces and goes in between his freaking toes <laughs> and i can't i don't even know what to say All right and he like freaking out like flicks it off his foot and it's like <laughs> popped mid air and like 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 nixon like skins him then it peaked on his eye or something i think it peaked on his eye or something happened <laughs> but i just remember like like holy shit <laughs> As fast as I got in here, <laughs> I'm about to, about be, to get kicked out. About to get kicked out. <laughs> this is well deserved. I kick somebody's ass out for right. blowing my kid's foot off. Right. Um, but yeah, the Hawaii. I mean, back to Hawaii, dude. That I mean, we I mean, we we also went surfing, which is one of our funniest stories. I mean, when you go to surfing in Hawaii, it's not like surfing in California. We have to paddle like far as you can think. You're just you talk paddling to somebody. and that paddling can't be normal, and paddling. Man. I'm like, what is happening here? Are we going to ride some waves? Like you literally paddled for so long, but we did, we did surfing. It was cool. Had fun. And you know, then you have to, pad- but not only that, then you're dog tired and you have to paddle all the way freaking back. That was ridiculous. So we get to the, we get to like, the Like, bro, shore. we're not freaking Hawaiian surfers, <laughs> <Right>? dude. 
Half of the we can't. We were with ten people. There's only like three or four now. Everybody freaking turn around. around and turn around. <laughs> but we get back, and these are these are like straight up, you know, Hawaiian boys, thick and thin, oh, like yeah. you know, big dudes into the chicks with their bikinis, and so like there were some girls that went with us, like this group of ten, and. <laughs> We're at the place. There's this hose, and he's like hosing off their feet, hosing off their legs, whatever. Which I didn't want to do my legs, but you know, it's like we, we go we go over there to like get our feet hosed off. That dude drops the hose, turns around, walks with the chicks. I'm like, oh, pretty my much God. throws this hose at us. Like this dude's like pretty much damn near painting their toenails. Right. It's like, ooh, I'm next. <laughs> Like, you got damn. yourself. Oh man, yeah, that was fun, fun trip, dude. I mean, the Pro Bowl was super cool too. I, you know, many people get to experience that. I remember my dad like yelling at Terrell Owens, telling him he sucked and stuff. Uh, it's freaking funny. Oh my gosh, <laughs> dude! I remember me and your dad almost got into it with some essay. That oh was yeah, there too. That's right. Oh my gosh, <laughs> I remember this guy was like blocking our view or something. But he was just standing like he wasn't even in a seat. And your dad said something. And this dude, like, you know, was freaking probably drunk. Yeah. And he was yelling like crazy stuff back at us. And I remember like I just like I said before, like I'm protective of a handful of people. And <laughs> your family is one of them. And I remember I'm just like a freaking like punk ass kid. And. This grown like essay adult is like yelling at us, and I'm yelling back at him. And I remember your dad just like, like Greg, shut up. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, uh, there, there's more to that story, but yeah. that that's that's pretty much what it was. But yeah, he got I think that guy got kicked out or something. But. Yeah, I think he got escorted out <laughs> yeah. for sure. <laughs> That was uh that was a fun trip because it also gave me the opportunity to connect with you know Travis and Toby, yeah. your younger brothers, which I didn't know that well besides when you guys are watching football. I truly remember <laughs> Toby just uh running down the the main, the living room catching passes like everybody took turns like throwing in the ball. Yeah. Like all day. All freaking day. <laughs> But the coolest- I mean, football is a big thing in our family. Like we watch football all day long on Sundays, and he literally like all day long he would catch passes. Yeah, <laughs> but coolest brothers. I was super proud to to be a part of that family because you guys truly tr- treated me like I was really part of the family. Like yeah. I did family pictures with you guys. That's right. It was always super. It was super weird for a lot of different reasons, but it's cool to reflect on it and just feel like you talked about. You got to experience what it felt like to, you know, put yourself, you know, second or last or whatever it may be. And now to look back and be like with a family that had so much going for them, they they were so selfless and they they thought about me. You thought about me. Your dad might have thought that he reminds me of myself. I wish somebody would have helped me out when I was young or whatever it may be. But I think that was a big part of it. But uh, it was uh, it was altogether amazing. Yeah, but I mean, you. No matter what, I think you've always respected that and respected them, and I think that. That went a long way with the whole, with everything. Cause there was, I mean, my dad had lots of talks with you that I remember different things happening. Many talks. <laughs> but, you know, you've always respected the fact that, and there's that appreciation of, you know, you took me in when you, when you didn't have to. And, you know, and I think you're right. Like with, when you talked about, they never, not that I ever heard, talked bad about your parents always encourage you to keep that relationship in that lane open. You know, I've gotten to know your dad and Sam quite, you know, Sam's awesome. Your dad's being much cooler <laughs> now. And, uh, it's been cool to like, kind of, you know, I got to your grandma, they came to our football games, some of that stuff, you know, so it's always been kind of cool that they left that door open. But, you know, I think that respect's always really been there, which is, 
pretty cool no matter what happens. Oh, yeah. And I wasn't, man, I was, at that time, I was not ready to hear any of that because I, for a long time, I would hear to forgive and stuff like that. I'm like, I would get so upset. You know how I am. I was, yeah. I would be enraged that anybody well, would bring tough. that would bring that up because I'd be like, like, I'm not forgiving like anybody for shit. Yeah. Like nobody deserves that. Mm -hmm. Like if anything, like I need to inflict some pain on these people <laughs> because I'm right. You know, I'm very lucky to be in this situation I'm in, but it's been a complicated life and it is still complicated because I've got, and I won't you know get too much into this, but I've got all these different families now and it's like, people now want to get their shit together right. and I've got to f somehow coordinate all these different things. And sometimes I get lazy on it and someone falls by the wayside and sometimes everybody does. Sometimes I'm just like, Nope, nobody gets, you know, a piece of me right now. I'm, I'm just with my family and that's all I care about where it's something that constantly, you know, working on to, to be more in the mix of all that. Yeah. But we were talking about earlier and I think until you, that's why I wanted to share our backstories and stuff. Cause I think until you get to know that piece and understand that piece, like so many things that you don't know about somebody and you can't really judge it by a book by its cover. It's, if you don't understand the whole story, like there's so many pieces to yeah. you juggling so many families like now and you being an adult and having to allow these people back in your life and making that choice to when you don't have to, and maybe you didn't want to. Now you have to be the adult again. Like when you were the adult, when you were 12 and you were the adult when you were 16 and when you were eight, when you're walking your brother to school, like you had to be the adult a lot. And it's like, and it's old, yeah. you know, it gets to a point where it's like people expect things of me now mm -hmm. where it's like, like I got my own shit now. Where the hell were you when I needed you? Mm -hmm. So it's, it's difficult and it's gotten, you know, a, a million times, it's gotten a million times better, but. Well, my dad, my dad is my hero for the reasons I said, but you truly are one of my other heroes because I think I, I tell you all the time, you, your story life life tells you that you should end up you should you should have ended up in a ditch or you should be in jail i mean those are your two options when you get raised the way you got raised um <laughs> you don't you don't get to be who you are without hard work sacrifice and some some sometimes getting blessed you know with somebody like me and my family but it's you get you you've taken the opportunities that you've been given since then and turn them into something amazing and just like my dad i'm super proud of you because you're when you when i watch you and i watch your your family and your girls and i see that love that you have and that i think you're one of the best dads i've ever seen and to me it's pretty incredible to watch that transition because i've been with you since that moment of sitting in that truck you know on that day and you shouldn't be, you shouldn't be who you are. You shouldn't be what you have. And you worked very, very, very hard. We haven't even gotten into some more of the high school stuff, but there's so many things that we've gotten over and you've accomplished. You know, you don't make excuses. I said that earlier in our conversation, a lot of people in life make excuses. I've been dealt this hand that's poor and poor me, poor me. I'm just going to milk this for the rest of my life. Live off the government, be poor, do this and that, get in trouble but you chose to not do that and you choose that every day and you choose to fight those demons and fight that battle every day. And to me, it's super, super impressive. And I'm very, very proud of you because I've been in all those moments. I appreciate that brother. And you're obviously my hero as well. That means everything in the world to me that encourages me to, to kind of keep doing, you know, what I'm doing day in, day out. And she, you know, dude, I love you till the day I die. It's just the way that it is. It's the way that it'll always be. For sure. It's been a, been a pretty cool journey, man. 
Hey, pool chasers. By now, you probably met the awesome guys at Primate Pool Tools, either at a trade show or through Instagram. I'll tell you what, we love what these guys are doing and the quality product they bring to the market. They're the makers of the first carbon fiber pool poles in the industry. Their poles use high quality Modus 3 grade carbon fiber and are five times stronger than premium aluminum poles, which allows them to be half the weight and makes it easier to navigate through the water. Primate offers three models of poles in various sizes, as well as single link extensions that are compatible with any pole model. This will allow you to extend your pole up to 40 feet. Plus, if you ever need to replace any parts, their poles are modular so you can do so individually. And best of all, they're handmade here in the good old US of A. If you aren't convinced already, the Primate team backs their product up with a one-year warranty that covers any and all manufacturing or workmanship defects. These poles are truly the real deal, so try them out by going to primatepooltools.net and don't forget to enter Pool Chasers 10 at checkout for $10 off. Click the link below to find out more. So now we end up, what, back uh, our senior year. I mean, yeah. <laughs> within the junior year, I'm, <laughs> I'm uh, probably in like two different schools. Oh, that was yeah, when man, I was it, living with she, my, when I was still living with my mom. Yeah, she pulled I, you out. <laughs> yeah, pulled me out. And I went to another school far away. It was like a, it was like, it was supposedly a good school. It was a public school. Up on a mountain. Dude, I... <laughs> I'm going to tell you that I don't even know if I've told you this first day of this school, I get on the bus, go to the school. I didn't know that the first stop was at the middle school before. <laughs> and so we stop and I'm like in the front of the bus or whatever. And I get off and there's only like a handful of kids that get off and everybody's still on the bus and they go up to the high school <laughs> and I'm like, what the yeah, you freak? <laughs> like, oh, they pick up and drop off everybody. Okay. So I had to walk to the high school from the middle school, which is not close. <laughs> not close. <laughs> so yeah, but then you got that and then you went to like the, the, the like troublemaker school, which we always make fun of and crack up because there's like four chicks in there that were pregnant that were hitting on you. Options. <laughs> Options for you. Oh yeah, options for you. <laughs> yeah, some. I'm dude. This was like the first week in. Some girls talking to me, and I remember I was like, okay, talking for a second, and she like like gets up to go sharpen her pencil or whatever, and she's like like super like, pregnant. super pregnant. I was like, okay, uh, <laughs> yep, I know where I'm at now. <laughs> So did that for a little bit and then finally get back to the summer, which, you know, I'm living with you guys and make my first bonehead mistake because I think your dad has to do some convincing or something. For some reason, I had to do something to get me back into the school. Um, so I, I, you know, I'm going back to the school and we all think it'd be a good idea for me to play basketball <laughs> in the in the summer league. Oh um, gosh. So we're in the summer league. It's like first practice or Yeah, yeah, I think pretty sure first one. <laughs> first practice. <laughs> and we're doing something and somebody is just getting on my nerves on the basketball court. Like I don't know if they're messing with me or what it is. Basketball's like really not my sport cuz I just um got too much of a temper for it. But I remember, you know, freaking out, damn near getting like in a fight on the court. And I pretty much just like walk off the court and the coach is like saying stuff to me and I'm just like, I'm just mouthing off to him. <laughs> and it's just, it's all freaking really bad. Well, some type of like rest, like you, you hit elbowed him and then you guys got in a fight and you, you punch the, the whatever padding. padding. Yeah. And then, yeah, you got kicked out like the first <laughs> practice. <laughs> and that, yeah, I think I don't, whatever happened when your mom pulled you out, you got you had gotten in trouble for something and they didn't want to let you back in the school. So my dad was on the school board, got you yeah. back into school, and then that happened the first day. <laughs> Dude. Oh man. Oh I remember that conversation, that's for sure. That one was uh he said, Greg, what? <laughs> Dude. I remember you I mean you know your dad. Yeah. It was just that like like talking to him like Greg, on the first day, the first day, school hasn't even started yet. 
the first day of practice? Like, you know what I had to freaking do to get you into this school? Like, like I don't even want to talk to you right know, now, dude. Like, what the hell is the matter with you? Like, get yourself under control. Oh, so funny. <laughs> but anyway, so yeah, that started our senior year. And football starts right after that. Oh, yeah, because we had, we had Hell Week and whatever else. Yeah. But, I mean, that that football season, man, was t- one of the funnest times of my life. I I mean, be, me being quarterback and you being a receiver and being best friends, couldn't really couldn't really ask for, like, more fun. I mean, I we was such to, a good time. So fun, man. I mean, yeah, I'm going to, like, Chinese buffet before practice. Dude, we are crazy, like, <laughs> dude. But I remember I was going to – I wrote this down. I, Red Bull had just become legal, like, right – like they had it, but before or they wouldn't let people under 21 drink it. Like you had to, you weren't allowed to really. Yeah. Like our, our senior year, it became like on the shelves where you could buy it. And I remember that was like the craziest. Now I drink any drinks all the time and barely feel it. But like then <laughs> when, you, <laughs> when you, before energy drinks were around, like when Red Bull came out, man, and that was like senior football season, dude, I remember feeling like sitting there and your hands are just shaking. You're <laughs> so amped up. And that was crazy, but it was, I mean, it's energy drinks, Chinese food before practice, like all kinds of crazy stuff. But we also, we always call it 21 to 51 because I was 21, you were 51. I had a ton of fun. One of my favorite ones, I think, was the Joshua Springs game, which I was talking about you, your parents coming and seeing that game because I threw, I don't know, you had a lot of catches, but I threw two touchdowns to you and we had a lot of fun. One of them was a, the last play of the game was your second touchdown, which was cool. We still lost by like 20 points, but that's, that's a typical, <laughs> <laughs> typical Victor Valley Christian uh, score. But you just learn to appreciate the the fun parts of losing and when you go to a Christian school. So, yeah. But that game was cool. And Sam and your dad were there. And I think your grandma was there too. But yeah, it was super fun. It was, it was so much fun because it wasn't for the first time, wasn't worried about what I was going home to. I mean, we we were in the mother-in-law quarters or whatever you call it. Yeah. Where, I don't know, man, we were pretty much just like roommates and be on these road trips and then get to go like back home. And man, it was seriously like a freaking dream. Yeah. Had such a good time like playing football together. Yeah. I, I wrote down to you. I was, this is where I learned one of those, again, one of those, uh, Firstborn lessons of Friday night football and Saturday night freaking yard work or Saturday day, Saturday morning oh, yard yeah. work. <laughs> Waking up with freaking monkey, monkey bumps on my arms from getting hit. Bruised. And bruised, can barely walk. And then you got to get up and do mow the whole yard. And my dad doesn't just mow yards. Like you got to get the mower, the edger, the blower. I mean, I, I knew how to do, I could go work for a landscaping company. I mean... <laughs> So you know what? I don't like this palm tree here anymore. Why yeah. don't we get why don't we get this out of here and you know put this somewhere else like shit, man. Oh, <laughs> we just right. planted all six of those. <laughs> Damn. Like <laughs> No, yeah, that was that was, was all really, really good stuff. Did you man, I've done done some crazy projects. I remember I was like, hey, like need you for dude I need you for a second. Like never a second. I know. <laughs> Like oh you, you're not half af- half my day goes by. you're not yeah you're not afraid of heights or something like oh, okay <laughs> so it's like I remember I, he like gave me a flashlight and there's like a ladder in the house and it was like all right well we're gonna like go up in the attic and we need to like you know spray this insulation <laughs> and like all this and I, <laughs> I didn't like fully understand because I didn't really like grow up that way I yeah. didn't really know this. But it was just like, yeah, it turned into like a full <laughs> day project. And now that I'm in a house, I'm like, dude, that like this was like a full day of like running around an addict. With, I think like Doug or yeah, something, yeah, like, something that. like that. And we were like spraying insulation. It was like, <laughs> all right. Like, <laughs> we definitely earned. Uh, you definitely earned staying there sometimes. <laughs> we want to do. We need to put some new windows in the, in the so house. So you're not paying rent. So uh, <laughs> right? you get in the attic. <laughs> Hey, that's, that's the least, that's the least I can do. It's like a Goodwill hunting uh-huh. or no, not the rainmaker when oh, yeah. he's got to do the yard work for the lady, but she's got like crazy ass yard work for him to do. 
No, it yeah, was it was yeah. always it was always. This uh, is I remember it wasn't me and you, but I remember I was in Arizona, and uh, Toby for some reason my dad convinced Jerry, one of his best friends, and Toby to do a sand change on our pool, and he didn't wasn't even involved, so I don't even know how. <laughs> how my dad got out of not doing any of it, but <laughs> like <laughs> they one of his Damn. best friend, one of his best friends. And then Toby like to do a complete sand change. And it was on a, one of those, one of those old PB, whatever you call them with the, with all the million bolts around the sides. Oh, and yeah. it was like, they had to take all those off and like take the sand out and replace it. And like, no, had no idea what they were doing. Holy <laughs> but, smokes. So Toby did get that Man, one. He is, your dad is a good salesman. <laughs> Right, <laughs> Toby did get that one, but yeah, we had a good senior year, man. There was a, a lot of fun. I remember uh, our senior trip to New York. The movie White Castle had just come out, and I never heard of White Castle, which is probably funny to some people because they're all over the country. But yeah, me we either. don't we don't have them in California, so or at least we didn't then. We might now. We got, we just got a big big one here in Arizona with like bars and everything crazy. I mean, you're gonna get through the story, but we have bakers. <laughs> Oh yeah, we have and, bakers and bakers. So I, I'll take bakers over White Castle all day long. But yeah, at this sure. point in time, this was the thing. Yeah, we didn't have White Castle, and yeah, bakers is way better. So, anyways, we get to we didn't really get along much with anybody else in our senior class. So it was like me and you and some, you know, a few others. But we had determined before going to New York that like we were going to go to White Castle, and based on this whole movie, and nobody wanted to take us to White Castle. We're two like eighteen year old kids <laughs> figuring our own way through New York City trying to we find pretty a much white castle. Live <laughs> this movie, like getting totally lost. Oh. And dude, I don't know if it was the time, but dude, we couldn't get a taxi to save no. our life, dude. Like I don't know, like it's very fast paced there. I mean, already like feeling so many different things i mean i've already we've been in canal street getting I, i've bought already a couple fake rolexes oh, yeah. <laughs> tiffany's like, necklace <laughs> Tiffany <laughs> oh, we man. All, oh man we, every every guy on that trip bought his girlfriend one of those oh, tiffany man. necklaces and they, and they turned all their necks green <laughs> everybody's turning green oh man oh everybody tried to play it off like it was real oh man that's so funny but anyway we walked like three freaking miles or something to get to but we White kept Castle. getting like lost like man we because we had like the subway card and <laughs> we're taking the subway to the you pop up and we're like shit we're this in brooklyn like, <laughs> we are not in the wrong great city man like and then I mean, if anybody really knows me I'm, I'm pretty picky with the way i eat food and in, in white castle there's like onions on all their burgers <laughs> so i try to tell lady can i get one with no onions and she's like no we, that's in our batter or whatever and so i tried to play off this whole thing about being allergic to onions didn't work. <laughs> it's in the the frozen yeah. patty. It's a, there's no way to <laughs> take that out. I'm like, I don't understand. I'm super allergic. <laughs> Too bad, kid. Go eat somewhere else. I'm like, I walked three miles for this onion nasty burger. You are crazy picky. I am definitely not. But I remember I was hungry as hell <laughs> after that. All that shenanigans. Right. It was fun, man. But yeah, we basically, Larry lived it. But yeah, it was a cool trip and. Remember the movie? Uh, we watched the movie Longest Yard in the theater there, oh, and yeah. like everybody got obsessed with the soundtrack for it because it was like, oh yeah, uh, wasn't it? Nelly was in that movie, right? He's a running back. Yeah, some Nelly, <coughs> some Eminem, some yeah. But Nelly's in the movie. He's the running back, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No so, shoes. Yeah, so it was pretty fun. But yeah, that that, that soundtrack played a lot <laughs> over the next couple of weeks in our in our world, but, and then. Leave it to me. I think we might have put an end to the uh, traveling senior trips <laughs> for the school because, unfortunately, uh, some shenanigans went down and got into a fight. <laughs> I, didn't know, I didn't know we were going to talk about that. <laughs> I am because – so get in this fight, and I end up storming out, and I hit this metal door pretty much with everything I have. And I break my hand on the trip. Yeah. And this was like the end of the year. So I I was going to football all stars. Oh, that's and right. I'm like doing all of this with like a broken hand. <laughs> and I didn't even want to go to the like doctor or anything. But you know, I remember it got to a point where they're like, dude, you've let this go on too long. Like it's we have to re break it. Yeah. So 
that, that, that never happened. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> it's like, yeah, well, that's... but I went through that, <laughs> man, I remember I went through that whole, like all-star the, the week of practice and all those different things, like with a broken hand, it still didn't throw me the football because they did not like me very much. <laughs> Well, that's another thing I got gypped on being <laughs> some freaking quarterback who came and throw a football. I didn't even make it. Dude. That guy, why was, they got that guy was horrible. That's why they got slaughtered. Yeah, they did. <laughs> but, yeah, it was a good man. We came back and graduated, had some good times at Pizza Hut before I kind of moved to Arizona. It was, just, it was a really good, really cool, fun senior year, man. Yeah. One of the best times for sure. Wouldn't change any of it for, for anything. You know, it's funny because kind of conned you into playing baseball. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and that just ended up being like, I mean, yeah, we were getting slaughtered left and right. But I think we took it serious, but it was definitely a lot more relaxed than football. Yeah. And we had just fun with, you know, the road trips and all the other things. And it wasn't like as serious as people are probably going to have like a weird feeling towards me on some of this, but if you have any questions, feel free to like DM us and we can talk you through some of this. But I forgot on our, when we played football, one of our last games that the refs actually left the game. <laughs> oh, Cause of the fight. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I don't know what anybody else would do, but you know, one of our uh, wide receivers is like, this guy's Their messing with him. Yeah, the safety's stuck. on him like the whole time, like just talking crap, you know, kind of messing with him. And then finally they're just on the ground, like kind of brawling. Brawling a little bit. <laughs> so of course, like I run out there and <laughs> just start getting into it. And then kind of both sides get onto the field. And I remember I just I'm just seeing uniforms and 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 fists and whatever. And I remember our coach, Obi, just grabbing me by the jersey and, like, dragging me across the field yep. from the sideline, like, all the way to the sideline and just throwing me <laughs> on the bench. And I swear <laughs> to God, my, like, my Butt ass was, was sore for, like, <laughs> like a week. Oh. And he yelled something at me, and I, yeah, it was just the yeah, refs ended up leaving the, the game, and, uh, yeah, it was just a total chaos. But Yeah, we ran a lot for that crap. <laughs> <laughs> like, uh, dude, just make Greg run for that. <laughs> that was your fuzz, more the receiver. But either way, I think the coolest part for me, or one of the coolest parts, is I was always just kind of like, I don't know, man, this shyer, nice kid, but then – when we became best friends, it changed. I got this little cockiness in me because I knew, like we've we've talked about some of your some of your <laughs> some of your uh, antics already with you know, you lashing out, but everybody knew not to mess with you, <clears throat> which was pretty cool for me, being your best friend. And I got a little little cocky sometimes with being able to run my mouth because nobody's gonna mess with me. I don't remember. It. Did you want to tell the story about the detention? <laughs> oh my gosh! I mean, it's sim- I mean, not quite as similar as my brother, but you know, um, very you know protective of Ty. So school's getting out. Somebody kind of runs up on me and says, "This dude was saying something to Tyler," and da 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 da. And I remember like, "Say no more!" Like I just take off, and I knew this dude was in detention. <laughs> And I remember just storming into the detention room and the guy that was kind of like, I don't know, babysitting these kids in detention. Um, <laughs> he he kind of knew me enough to know that probably have a problem about to happen. All right. And he tries to stop me and I like just push him off me and <laughs> dude is in there. There's talking crap to Ty oh. and just freaking uh, start going at this dude. I flip him over in his desk and we just start going at it, but that's, uh, that was just that yeah. thing, man. Like you wanted to learn to skate. And I remember we oh, were yeah. in the parking lot at the, the movie theater, uh, red Robin or whatever. Mm-hmm. And I remember these kids, there's like three kids yelling. You were, you know, I was trying to show you like how to all your kickflip or whatever. And they were yelling something like crazy at us. 
And I remember like I just got on my board and I just went right over. And I remember you were just like, dude, like leave it like, alone, leave it alone, leave, like, dude, seriously, what the hell's wrong with you? And the greatest thing in the world happened. I roll over there, and their mom and dad get out of the car. Yep, and they're just like. Like, well, what's going on? I'm like, dude, I'm like, punk ass kids are yelling at me and my buddy over here. Da 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 da. And dude, their parents made them apologize and they said sorry. And it was all oh, that's awesome. Genius. It was no, awesome. No no uh fist got thrown <laughs> and got an apology and they feel very small. They probably never do that again. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> I thought for sure though, when mom and dad got out, like I thought for sure they were going to tell me off. Yeah. That's usually how it happened. <laughs> like sometimes like Apple doesn't fall far from the tree. Right. I'm like, well, you do suck. Yeah. <laughs> like, well, I'm going to whoop your ass too. <laughs> oh, man. But that didn't oh, happen. Good parents. Yeah. Good um, times, man. That's very a, good. It's a, it's a bond, man, that we've shared for a long time. It's just, it's just really, it's really cool, man. It's fun. It was, it was really good for me for... Yeah, being able to be pretty much say do whatever I wanted. <laughs> <laughs> That's good because you you did uh, talk some smack on the uh, basketball court oh, and yeah. Yeah. different things like that. But you usually held your own. But oh, talk about sometimes it. I didn't even let you say or do anything. Like I just <laughs> I just did it. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There's quite a bit of those moments of holding you back, yeah. and you know, back to your <laughs> back to your talking about your ephedra thing. I think that that played a big piece of that, you know, and there's mo we won't get into many of them, but there was like moments where, I mean, man, you just snap and you're blacked out and I have no idea what's going to happen. And you're like going crazy. I'm like, I'm, I mean, I wrote, I read on your back a few times <laughs> <laughs> to stop you from doing some stupid stuff, but it's just kind of part of that, you know, that but ephedra that messed you up and just that, ability to snap but i think that goes in uh is another success for you that you've been able to beat mostly but you know there's so many we're talking about it right now because this is kind of like the highlight reel of the the good and bad but you know there's so many days that went by where none of this happened yeah. most of this most of these things were all like done out of me i think trying to protect people and people that I truly loved. I never wanted to see them mm -hmm. in pain or feel anything. So it wasn't really too much to it, but I always, stuff would happen and it was constantly, I was always in training. You know, we always talked like all the time, like so many times that things would happen and me and you would just, it's pretty crazy because we were like little adults. Like there was no, there was sometimes when there there was no laughing or funny business. It was really just like, what happened here, man? Like, let's let's talk about it. Something mm -hmm. I don't know, or we need to figure this out. And slowly but surely, because you guys weren't giving up on me, we were things were really getting better and starting to to figure things out. Yeah, we had a lot of good times of like we talked about earlier, not having to wear masks and just hanging out watching movies i mean some movies i haven't i've still only ever seen like <laughs> in high school that, you know that we watched together i'm like yeah i've seen that with you one time you know <laughs> like, you remember that part of the movie yeah yeah i remember uh 2003 2004 when we watched that thing i haven't watched it since but you know it's uh i don't know, man it was comfortable it was cool to be in that environment and we had plenty of good times like that or just chilling and hanging out and it developed a deep deep friendship and you know genuinely caring about each other and loving each other in a in a whole nother level and it's pretty cool to there's a we can go we can talk about it forever but that, oh yeah it's a there were some very very good times of like you said we were like little adults you know some of the stuff we went through no kids should go through um together so yeah i mean we've uh I wrecked your Bronco getting <laughs> yeah. took your truck out and we got food like during practice or something. I think somebody did run a stop sign 
But the next accident we got into was not quite that. I'll tell, I gotta, gotta tell this story. So we, <laughs> we go on this crazy long, like road trip, um, because I have this Toyota pickup truck and I think your dad probably sold it on eBay or something yeah. like that. Somebody bought it. So ties in one truck, I'm in another that we got to deliver and it's like a four, four or five hours. hour yeah, trip to deliver this thing. And we pretty much get to the street to deliver this thing. And <laughs> I think you might have like, you didn't see the street or something and you kind of immediately turned in, but I was probably driving way too close and just run into the back of you. And now we are sitting with two <laughs> like wrecked trucks. wrecked trucks. And the the person that bought the truck lived so close that she like, heard the accident. heard the accident and came out and was like talking with us like Is like, that my truck? Yeah. <laughs> that was the worst experience. If you're ever. expecting a Toyota pickup truck, yeah, <laughs> yeah this yours. is your truck. <laughs> So that uh, was, was the longest four hour oh, drive back dude. ever. <laughs> Terrified. Really thought life was over at this point. Dude. Yeah. That was that's a crazy, crazy. That was definitely a wild one. <laughs> yeah. That's cool, man. That's crazy. There's tons of stories we could talk about forever, yeah. but, but you know, <clears throat> you know, something that has always stuck with me and is a big, there's a lot of reasons why we're doing this episode, but we had, you know, one of our, better technicians at brothers pool service say something to us one day that oh, I'll never forget and shared, I think probably shared a story with him. And he said that like, that's crazy. I, I thought you were just two Scottsdale guys. Like you guys Real born and rich. born and raised here. And yeah. you know, you're just, you know, doing this thing. And it's like, oh. <laughs> Far from it, dude. Far from it. I don't have time to, to get into it. But right. I told Ty, I was like, when this episode gets done, I'm going to send it to him. Yeah. <laughs> so that's for you, Jimmy. <laughs> You're right. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I'm, then I moved to Arizona and we kind of, you know, spent probably five or six years where we didn't talk a whole lot. Probably talked on the phone maybe 30 minutes a couple of times a year just to see how we we were doing. But you know, I, I, I think the next time we kind of really saw each other was at my wedding in 2009 when you came and were part of the wedding party. And then kind of, I think what we were just talking about earlier, I, I had Maddox in 2012, you had Ryland in 2013 and I came to Victorville to, to see her cause you were very important to me and I wanted somebody to be there for you during that. So I came out and I think that's kind of where we reconnected quite a bit and went to what would you say Molly Brown's? Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. So hung out and kind of just talked about life again and where we were at in it. And shortly after that, you know, less than a year after that, you came out for 4th of July, which is told in episode one. Yeah. 4th of July came out in the pool route with me and <laughs> kind of starts the whole second chapter, I guess. Yeah. And that was a, that was a great, you know, moment, especially I've been working at the base for eight years. That was a long commute drive and, you know, really had the entrepreneur spirit and always looking for opportunities while working at the base, developed a face mask company. And I was really excited about that and did a lot of different things with it. And that was really my education as an entrepreneur where I learned how to to brand a product, take photos of a product, how to work with cut and show shops, how to kind of wheel and deal with these people in LA. I lost a lot of money by not doing business correctly. I learned everything I needed to know going into the next chapter. So you know, when we were going into the 4th of July visit, I remember you just talking about it. Like I got super excited because I think we didn't talk so much back then, but I didn't think you were somebody that would start a business, especially because you were working more of a corporate job and you were kind of moving up and yeah. doing different things with it. Like I just didn't see that. And then pools, I'm like, shit, like <laughs> that's, that's kind of crazy. And then 
really looking into it, looking at the pool service companies, Scottsdale, Phoenix, and the surrounding area. I don't know anything about pools, but I know how to do research. And just seeing that nothing was really being done out here, like there's no lifestyle companies. There's no, nobody has reviews on Google or Yelp or any of these platforms. Like it just looked like it was ready for the taking. Mm -hmm. Like somebody could really step into this and be, successful and to this day man we went out and cleaned those pools <laughs> after that fourth of july man <laughs> that was some of the most freaking work i've ever done because not only do we do like an insane amount of pools and they were wrecked <laughs> but i've never even like cleaned pools before right i mean <laughs> like really cleaned a pool yeah like talking vacuuming and skimming and brushing and you were Equipment's you know, it's not working. Yeah. You were back there like working on equipment cause something wasn't working correctly and I wasn't done yet. So you'd be <laughs> done with that. And we'd go back to still cleaning the pools. Yep. It was rough, man. <laughs> it was, but I loved it. Yeah. It was fun. There's a lot. We had, we had a lot of fun together too. It yeah. kind of reminded me of being back at the mattress store. I mean, this is definitely like 10 years later or something like that. Oh, but, yeah. But I remember like that old feeling of, putting in the work, but it was like we picked up right where we left off. Yeah. And that was something that I didn't have at my base job. I mean, I had really good friends, but it was, it's just, is not, it's definitely not the same. Right. Yeah. I mean, that whole time your, your base, you know, chapter of your life and you owning your home played a big part in our business. I mean, my experiences here in Arizona played a big part in, I had so many jobs that I didn't really know why. And then they kind of make more sense now that we do what we do. But, you know, I cleaned windows for two years up in Cave Creek and Carefree, which is even the more kind of elaborate area in Scottsdale. Like, and so I like, guess a crew leader there I had to learn how to talk with all these rich people and deal with their, if you've never been to Arizona or Scottsdale, there's a lot of those kind of houses where you have, um, property managers and you deal with property managers and we talk to the homeowners. So it's like this crazy (laughs) system of learning how to communicate, which I never knew would play out kind of in our favor, but you know, running a Scottsdale pool company that came into play quite a bit, which was cool. I got to, you know, I understood these people in a way and knew how to talk to them and give them what they want. And, you know, I was able to avoid a lot of drama and we were able to by, some of our experiences and, and that. And, you know, at the at the corporate job I was running, I was helping people run their businesses. So I learned a lot of that back end stuff. And, you know, your your background with logistics helped a lot with organization of things and the warehouse and lots of different stuff. So there's a, when you think about it, our journey and the jobs and things we've done all led up to kind of that moment together and building this pool company that went from zero to 400 in less than three years uh and came out of nowhere <laughs> to kind of dominate the scottsdale market and yeah. i think we could have been we could have been four time four times the size if we didn't adjust and restructure and only take on the good pools if we just took on everything we got we would have been easily over a thousand pools in you know probably four or five years so it's pretty pretty crazy man all of our life journeys led to that kind of working together again and then turn into all this <laughs> yeah it's been an incredible journey and um really happy with the way that things turned out anybody wants to hear more kind of about how we even got to doing pool chasers full time that's uh, way back in the archive. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it is. Episode 30 is a pool chaser story. Episode one is brother's story. Oh, okay. Well, I wanted to kind of just end it with what you mean to me. And if you want to do it, that's fine too. But, you know, I think all this is a, uh, it's a pretty cool story and we wanted to share it because it it's a big piece of who we are and what we do. But, you know, you, you bring out the best pieces in me. You know, you push me, make me want to be a better person and be a better everything I do. I had a lot of kind of the foundational pieces in my life from my parents and growing up in faith, but, you know, you brought so much more into it. 
with everything that we've been through, our talks and discussions, especially over the last couple of years have truly kind of broadened the way I think and do things. You, you've introduced me to people like Gary V, book, different books, ways to make myself better, you know, podcasts, different things that have taught me so many things along this journey. I owe you a lot of credit for my growth, I think, over the last three or four years specifically. And, you know, typically I think I tended to to trust people a little too much sometimes. And, you know, it's just something that's burnt me in the past. And I think it's a part of me. It's a piece of me. I'm still going to give people a shot to prove me wrong. But you've helped me see people and for who they are. And sometimes, you know, it's not good and, and see their bad intentions. And I think that's something that, that you've helped me develop and being able to read a room kind of or a person, something I'm, you've helped me with. It's allowed me to kind of use my values but not be so naive sometimes. And it's really helped me grow. I think being around you really allowed me to be who I truly was in high school and beyond. And besides Megan, you're the only person I feel like I can be 100% myself around. And uh, <laughs> your love for me, man, is uh, is truly incredible. It, it's very hard to tell the story in the, the importance that it means to me, but I know you do anything for me and vice versa, and it's really rare to to have somebody in your life that will do that. You know, we've seen many victories together, highest highs, you know, defeats, lowest lows, not much that can come kind of at us that we haven't been through or already prevailed for. So, you know, I know you didn't really mention it here yet, but you call me your guardian angel sometimes, which which I'm really honored to be. And honestly, I think that kind of goes both ways because I know I wouldn't really be who I am today without you. And besides my dad, again, like I, I've never seen or met anybody that has overcome something so incredible. Your family is truly blessed to have you and you, you inspire me. I think every day it's a true honor to be around you and be your friend every day. Thanks, man. That Man, it's hard to follow that up, but that, <laughs> that means everything in the world to me. I, You are my guardian angel. I have you here on my shoulder, and I would not be the person I am today without you, without your family. I'm forever grateful for it. There's nothing I can ever do to pay you and your family back for throwing that that raft out we've talked about this before we're in the ocean and i'm just about to drown and you guys throw that life raft out and pull me in and care for me and love me and feed me and clothe me and do the whole thing and being close to you never had a a friend like you before we couldn't be more opposite but it's just been a it's been a surreal life and i just I appreciate everything and I truly would do anything for you and your family. I mean a lot to me, man. I love you and I'm just going to keep this journey going on for forever and ever. Yep. Hey, pool chasers. Thanks for checking out this episode. Did you know that each episode has its own page on our website? This is where you can find more information about the guests and episode topic, as well as all the resources that we discussed throughout the show. To get to the webpage, click the link below. Also below, you will find links to the sponsors of the show, as well as links to follow us on our social media channels. On our channels, you will find some of our favorite clips and bonus material. Please follow us on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. Our tag is Pool Chasers. We also have a Facebook group for the Pool Chasers community. Here you will find like-minded professionals all looking to make each other better. One last thing. If the episode has brought you value, please check out our Patreon page to support us. And if you could please rate and review the podcast, we would love to hear what your favorite topics are. Thank you for your time and your ear. See you out there, pool chasers. chasers.